Sorry, so going back. Uh, now we are moving on to the talk by Adrián Arroyo from the Institute Catalá de Paleoecología Humana in Spain, uh, who will talk about the current research on the analysis of percussive tools from the early Stone Age, which is the African Lower Paleolithic, and how they can be compared to non-human primates percussive tools. Yeah. Uh, boa tarde. Uh, I'm afraid that this will be the only Portuguese I know. <laughs> So I, I apologize in advance, uh, and thank you very much for being here today. Uh, first, uh, let me thank Professor uh, Eduardo Autoni for organizing this workshop and the invitation to be here today. Um, and of course, at Paulo University to host Tom and I while we were uh, doing some stone tool analysis. In this presentation, I'll move a bit further from behavioral studies, as Tiago did this morning, and I will try to combine uh, these both uh, archaeology and primatology, and as you can see on the title, uh, I'll show you what I consider is the key point that connects primatology and archaeology, which is pounding uh, activities. Um, but how can we define these activities? Well, percussive activities can be defined as those actions in which an object is stroke with another one to be modified or reduced into a smaller pieces. This is a very basic behavior. Uh, and requires only two objects, and even just one. Uh, from the point of view of the archaeology, uh, of the lithic studies, uh, the stone tools involved in these activities have been grouped in two major categories. Active elements, uh, that are those tools used to transmit the force, for example, a hammerstone, and uh, passive elements, uh, which are those tools used to place the objects uh, that will be modified, for example, uh, an anvil. The truth is that there is a fact, which is that pounding activities are part of our daily life routines. Since we are babies, we all like to smash things around. And Tom is a, has a, a nine-month-old kid, and I'm pretty sure that he's smashing toys all around the house, uh, all over and over. Uh, but as we've seen today, uh, there are other non-human living primates uh, that do also different types of pounding activities, such as these Brazilian capuchin monkeys, long tie macaques, and of course, uh, West African chimpanzees. In general, uh, there are not many works that have focused on the study of these pounding activities or percussive tools. In any case, we know that pounding tools, such as hammerstones or bolas, uh, have been identified since the late 19th century. So this is, we are not discovering anything new. There were already people who was interested on, in, in those things. Uh, and some researchers even tried to unravel the use uh, they had. For example, uh, Leakey proposed that bolas were used on hunting activities. Uh, so that as pounding is a common behavior, uh, across different species, they can be uh, studied from different sources. So, of course, we have the archaeological tools, the ethnographic record. We also know that several hunter-gatherers group, they perform different pounding activities. We have, of course, uh, primatology and the experimental uh, archaeology that we all uh, do in, in our labs. In this talk, I will focus mainly on the archaeology uh, a little bit of primatological tools, tools uh, mainly focused on chimpanzee uh, and the uh, arche experimental archaeology. So first, uh, let's take a look at the pounding tools that have been found on the archaeological record, and particularly I will focus on the African uh, record. So this is the East African Rift Valley. Uh, this is where it all began. This is where the major concentration of lower Pleistocene archaeological sites have been found and where the oldest stone tools collections have been discovered. Uh, from here, you may know sites such as Gona or Adar, uh, Kobe Fora, West Turkana, or even Old Dubai Gorge. These are most, the most famous, uh, famous uh, sites. In all these sites, uh, the most common finds are stone artifacts. These can be cores, flakes, choppers, retouched pieces. Uh, we also know that these stone tools were napped, were flaked by hominins using different techniques, such as a free, uh, freehand napping, uh, bipolar flaking, or even the passive hammer uh, technique. Uh, also, different technological studies have shown that hominins chose specific raw materials, and they understood 
their, fra their fracture properties in order to successfully produce their tools. This means that hominins already knew what they were doing, so they were intentionally flaking uh, these cores uh, in order to obtain sharp uh, edges. Of course, uh, we also know that these flakes were used for multiple things, for example, plant cutting, woodworking, and uh, on butchering activities. Uh, in fact, butchering activities, which has been doing at least since 3.3 million years uh, ago, uh, has been uh, identified based on, on both, on cut marks on, on the bones, on the fossils, and also on use wear uh, that has been identified on, on flakes. If we take a closest look at the archaeological uh, material, among all African sites, as case study, I will use the site of Old Dubai Gorge. Uh, Old Dubai is a, basically a well-known place located in northern Tanzania. It was discovered back in 1911, and it was systematically excavated by Mary Leakey. Uh, in fact, this is a place that it is still being investigated uh, by several uh, different research groups. Uh, in fact, Old Dubai uh, represents a unique place to study hominin activities with an archaeological sequence that goes from 1.8 million years ago all the way up to 0.6 million years. So it covers more than one, years of human, uh, one million years of human evolution and with presence of two different uh, cultures. Uh, Old Dubai defined basically by uh, core and flake uh, production and a Julian uh, with presence of more large cutting tools such as hand axe or cleavers. From a general perspective, the main archaeological sites, as you can see on this map, they are all grouped in what is called the main uh, gorge and the side gorge. And basically, all these sites are located on, uh, on the east margin of the Old Dubai Paleolake. So let me see if this works. Okay, so if you could imagine the lake, the Paleo Lake would be around here, and all these sites were like on the margins uh, of the lake. Among the major findings uh, at Old Dubai was found, for example, uh, the famous Sinjantropus Boisei back in, in 1959, remains of Homo habilis, Homo erectus. Uh, and here, for example, it was also defined for the first, ta for the first time, the Old One technology. Uh, however, within these lithic assemblages, uh, there were not only flakes, cores, and, and, and retouched species, but also, um, and for the first time, Mary Leakey, uh, we found also other tool types that were not used for cutting activities. Uh, but in these cases, these other tools were used, in fact, on, on pounding activities. Among these passive elements, for example, it's identified that all the way we have anvils, and in her original publication, Mary Leakey already described anvils as cuboid blocks or broken covers with edges approximately 90 degrees, on which there is uh, butter marks and also plunging scars. So Mary Leakey already saw that there were tools that they were not coarse and could have been used uh, in, in percussive uh, activities. Regarding the active elements, the classical classification includes, for example, hammerstones, uh, which are basically cobbles with battery marks on one or both ends. Uh, there are all, also other tools probably related with uh, percussive activities that has, bom has been more widely discussed and uh, which this, uh, that are what Mary Leakey classified as spheroids and subspheroids, which normally have this round morphology uh, caused by a heavy used of the, of the blanks. There are also other tool types uh, classified based on the usual marks, such as this hammerstone with active edges, with uh, are normally tools uh, that has percussive marks on acute or angular areas, or hammerstones with fracture angles, which normally shows several detached uh, fragments detached from their surfaces. Finally, uh, there is another tool type that typically or, or has been considered as a passive element, but it also could be uh, used as an active element, uh, which are pitted stones. These tools are defined as cobbles with uh, depressions, with some concavities on their surfaces. And in the case of Old Dubai Gorge, these tools, 
appears mainly on the upper sequence, uh, on the upper part of the archaeological sequence in, in bed three and four. So recent analysis of the Old Dubai assemblages have stressed mainly the high number of these pounding tools at the Old Dubai sequence with large amount of not, not only of hammerstones, uh, but also large quantities uh, of anvils. In fact, uh, these studies also have noted that at Old Dubai there are sites in which percussive activities certainly played uh, an important role. And there are sites, for example, such as FLK North or FC West, where the presence of these percussive tools is much higher than the regular debitage. Uh, but still, there was one question uh, that need, needed to be solved. Uh, so we know that there are a lot of percussive tools, but what were they used for? So to answer this question uh, the, about the, the function of these tools, we can use, of course, traceology, uh, or the analysis basically of the marks left on the tools. And the first issue that I found when, when I began working on these percussive activities, on these percussive tools, uh, it is that despite of having a good knowledge of the technology of these lithic assemblages from African sites, as you can see here on this slide, there were just a handful of useware studies. No, so no, nobody did previous uh, or a thorough useware analysis of, of the collections. Uh, particularly at, at Old Dubai, uh, only Sussman did uh, functional studies of archaeological flakes. So she didn't do anything about the hammerstones or the anvil. She focused uh, on flakes. Uh, there are other useware studies on other African sites of like uh, Kobe Fora or Kanjera, but again, always, this has been done on, on flakes. Basically, until recently, there was no useware studies on early Stone Age pounding tools. So basically, when I began working with this material, nearly everything needed to be done. So based on all these findings that we had uh, at Old Dubai, uh, some research questions were raised. So what were these tools used for? In other words, in other words uh, which pounding activities did hominins, and how can we identify them? Uh, did hominins perform similar activities than living primates, and how similar are their tools? Can we compare hominin tools with primate uh, stone tools? Uh, in fact, this last question, leads to another one. Uh, are there primate tools in the early archaeological record? How far this behavior goes in the, in the archaeology? Uh, in any case, to answer all these questions, uh, it was necessary to set uh, a common protocol of analysis. And it is at this, at this point in which it is necessary to take a look at the experimental referen the reference collection. Uh, which is something that is, it is essential to understand useware formation processes and to characterize the damage present uh, on the tools. So the methodology we used uh, is based on the same protocols that has been systematically applied to experiments with modern humans and chimpanzees and the archaeology. Uh, some protocol, uh, such protocols include uh, technotypological descriptions of the tools, spatial distribution analysis of the useware traces using uh, GIS techniques, uh, in fact, this methodology allows us to quantify and search for patterns uh, of the locations of, the, of these marks. Uh, also, we, we apply the microscopic analysis uh, following pro uh, common procedures that have been done uh, on, on normally on user studies. Uh, in fact, applying these methods uh, to all assemblages is essential. Uh, basically, if we want to compare them, uh, uh, the results. In addition, uh, we have been also interested in applying new techniques, and particularly we focus on 3D scanning and the use of confocal microscopy, uh, basically to gain accuracy not only on the quantification of this modification uh, of these usual marks, uh, but also on, the, uh, on their identification. Uh, you need to understand that the older you have, uh, the older you, uh, your site is, the most difficult is to identify percussive marks. So we, we, we were trying to use these new techniques just to see if we managed to, to identify new uh, percussive marks that you cannot identify them with the naked eye. As I mentioned, uh, the first thing we needed was to build a reference collection and we began setting up an experimental program. 
Uh, in this case, we developed a multidisciplinary approach to investigate the possible activities that hominids uh, may have performed uh, with experiments that include uh, bone marrow extraction, meat tenderizing, plant pounding, nut cracking, and uh, bipolar napping. In fact, uh, as you can see in this table, quite a large number of uh, experiments have been done in this, uh, in this line. I think this, this table is not complete, so I, I, I'm still missing some of the latest uh, experiments. Uh, and the analysis uh, of these ex experimental anvils uh, allow us to differentiate use wear patterns based on the activity. For example, in the first case of uh, bipolar napping, uh, normally marks are clustered in, on central areas of the, of the anvils, while other activities such as bone breaking or, or nut cracking uh, tend to leave le uh, more scattered marks uh, across the, the surfaces. So once we knew that it was possible to distinguish different patterns based on the activity, uh, uh, we moved one step uh, forward. And we came back again to the archaeological tools and we started looking closely uh, at it. Uh, we began, for example, with an, uh, an analysis of uh, selections of pounding tools that originally were classified by Mary Leakey as anvils. And we saw that these tools have also particular marks, such as crushing or, or abrasions, uh, some microfractures as well, and distribution patterns that were quite similar with the results that we were having uh, when analyzing the experimental anvils. In fact, the, the spatial distribution uh, applied on some of these tools revealed that the surfaces normally have a very low degree of modification. There are very few marks on their surfaces. Uh, and also, it was noted that these marks tend to be located very close uh, to the edges. If we compare, for example, the, uh, the quantitative results of the analysis of the archaeological pounding tools with the ones obtained with the analysis of the experimental material, we can see that in terms of density, uh, distribution, and percentage of the surface covered by, by marks, there are quite a large number of similarities between the anvils used uh, for nut cracking and bone breaking on the experimental material and the results that we were having from the uh, from all the gourds. Also, uh, of course, this methodological approach uh, was applied to large collections from all uh, comparing, for example, two sites, the old one site of HWK East and the Asulian site of uh, EFHR. Uh, and here, for example, we saw that the, uh, at HWK East there is a wider variability of percussive tools that probably was related uh, to a wider range uh, of activity. In this, in this case, for example, we could even connect with the primate, uh, with the primate approach. And as we've seen, for example, in capuchin monkeys, where they use uh, tools for several activities. So in the case of HWK uh, something more or less similar could happen. So we have more, pound, more and different pounding tools because they were doing a wider variability of activities than in the, uh, uh, during the Acheulean. So now that we have a bit, a bit of an overview of the archaeological pounding tools, uh, let's see what we have in the primatological record. And there is something that it hasn't been mentioned today, but I think it is worth to note it, uh, that in the literature we can find very early reference about primate using tools. And we have uh, from these travelers, Portuguese travelers, or even uh, Spanish travelers uh, from the 16th century, uh, already noting that uh, chimpanzees were cracking nuts or capuchin monkeys that were, were called cats at, the, at that time uh, were doing uh, this, uh, some nut cracking already in the 16th, 16th century uh, or these uh, oyster monkeys opening oysters using tools uh, as noted by Carpet, Carpenter in the 19th century. So the, we know that these behaviors uh, that we have been studied and, and today we have been discussing, they already been doing for a long time. Once again, uh, we have to refer to Louis Leakey. Uh, from the archeology, span we always acknowledge, for example, the role that he had uh, in this world of the 
uh, primates or, or comparing primates and, and hominins, as uh, he was convinced that starting living primates, uh, we should be able to understand early uh, hominin uh, behavior. But what, what he did, basically, he encouraged three women to take the lead on the primatological studies, and for the first time, uh, 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 systematic studies of chimpanzees by Jane Goodall, uh, gorillas by Diane Fossey, and uh, orangutans by Virute Galdicas was uh, conducted. So thanks to their, their research and what many other scholars uh, have been doing over the past decades, and there is still uh, been doing, we can say that we nearly live on the planet of, of the primates. Uh, it has been shown, as it has been shown today, uh, they, these primates uh, or apes, uh, uh, they do a lot of activities and they allow us uh, even to say that they have their own uh, culture. Uh, we know, for example, that chimpanzees have been doing nut cracking for at least 2,000 years, uh, capuchin at least 3,000 years since she has been doing their, their activities. Uh, in any case, I'll focus, as I mentioned before, on wild chimpanzees. Uh, and it is already well known that they are pretty good at nut cracking. Uh, one of the most uh, studies placed in the, is the Bosu community in Guinea. Uh, here is, for example, a short video uh, where you can see the, one of the experimental sessions or, or visits that chimpanzees do to the uh, outdoor lab that uh, Tokyo University set there. So let's see. So normally the chimpanzee will arrive, uh, select uh, the anvil and the hammer stone, and, and, and crack open the, the, the knife. So um, there is one thing, and I don't know if you've ever tried. Uh, here we see a chimpanzee cracking a nut, and it seems that it is a very easy activity that anybody can do. Uh, the first time I tried to open a nut with uh, two stones, you better don't see the video because uh, I was horrible. So it looks easier than what the in reality is. So if not, if you don't trust me, just, just try it. Next time you go to the shop, buy some nuts and, and take, two, take two stones and, and try to, to open them. So when looking at some of these tools used for this uh, Voshu community, uh, we managed to identify different types of percussive marks, such as depressions, these concavities on the surfaces of, uh, of the rocks, uh, also impacts, some fragments that occasion, occasionally were detached from hammer stones and, and from the anvils. Uh, and also we applied some 3D techniques to analyze user patterns. Uh, in this study, for example, we focus on parameters such as roughness or, or the slope in order basically to uh, identify specific uh, modifications, specific changes across uh, the surfaces. Uh, in fact, as you can see on that uh, image over there, uh, by looking at the roughness changes, we managed to identify the areas with higher concentrations of uh, percussive marks, which are uh, highlighted in, in red. So, th in fact, 3D techniques uh, works pretty well to identify uh, usual marks. Uh, however, uh, if we want to compare both assemblages, wild chimpanzees and, and archaeological and hominin tools, we see that wild chimpanzees' tools are not made, made on the same raw materials as hominid pounding tools. And therefore, it is tricky to compare them, uh, basically because raw material has uh, important implications on in use -well formation processes. For example, we see that a chimpanzee, uh, the chimpanzee tools have uh, normally depressions, but then when we go to the hominid anvils, we don't find those depressions. So why is that? It's basically the difference on the raw materials. So that to solve that problem and to have a, a, a control over a greater number of variabilities, uh, an experiment was set in collaboration with the Kumamoto Sanctuary in Japan. Uh, we sent them some quartzite blocks from Oldubai to have the same uh, raw material being used. 
uh, and they did, they perform also nut, nut cracking. Uh, and with this uh, collaboration, we also aim to create a chimpanzee stone tool refer reference collection that can directly be compared with the archaeological record. Uh, in fact, this sanctuary used to be a bio uh, biomedical center, but since 2011, uh, Kyoto University is taking care of it, and it hosts uh, a total of 59 chimpanzees and six, six bonobos. Uh, here, I will show you first a short clip of one of the sessions of this uh, uh, that they did uh, with using uh, all the white rocks. <laughs> So here you obviously uh, can see some behavioral differences. For example, in this case, this last uh, uh, part of the video, the instructor, Satoshi Data, was helping the chimpanzee when the nut rolls out. Uh, in the wild, obviously, the chimpanzee, either if the nut is too far, will not care and take <laughs> one which is uh, closer, or it will go pick up the nut and come back uh, to the tools. Uh, this, I mean, it's true that there are behavioral differences, but uh, my main interest was uh, on the rocks. So uh, for my study, it didn't, didn't bother me uh, at all. So to sum up, uh, also, of course, uh, we applied uh, the same methodological uh, protocols of analysis that we did for human exper uh, experiments and um, for the archaeology. Um, we describe in detail the user marks of the surfaces. We map also some uh, presence of residues. Uh, and to sum up, as we can see in this table, these were all the, the tools that were used for, for by chimpanzees. Uh, the majority of the user traces basically were located close to the edges, uh, and in general, uh, pounding tools used, uh, or quartzite uh, pounding tools used by captain chimpanzees tend to show a low degree of modification. Uh, also, from a technological point of view, it is worth to remark the presence of some fragments that were detached. Uh, in this case, I want to stress the presence of these three positives that possess basically the same features as the napping flakes with uh, bats, impact points, even uh, bulb uh, of, of percussion, uh, but in this case, uh, these pieces uh, were detached from a single tool. They all came from from this uh, object that was used uh, by Kotaro, which is the less skilled chimpanzee, uh, who was basically hitting quite often the hammer against the anvil. Uh, basically, uh, those individuals that are less skilled will tend to produce more damage on the tools and occasionally will fracture. Uh, uh, either the hammer or the anvil. In addition, uh, we also did user spatial distribution analysis, and the results were quite consistent across the entire collection, uh, with low percent percentage of the surfaces covered by percussive marks, uh, with an off-center distribution, very low density of marks, and this was quite, I was, when I was so, when I first saw the, uh, did this uh, analysis and I saw the results, I was quite happy. Um, happy and, and intrigued, uh, basically because these results were similar to the ones that we obtained of the, uh, from the analysis of experimental anvils used uh, by modern humans to crack open nuts. So when using the same raw materials, in terms of the use word marks and the, their, their distribution, Humans and chimpanzees are not that different. So we see that the, the raw material has an effect, at least on the, on the formation and on the distribution of the marks. Also, I was interested in on understanding the user formation uh, processes on, on these tools used by captive chimpanzees. Uh, so I reviewed all the videos and I managed to identify why uh, three processes that explain this uh, the, this distribution of the marks on the chimpanzees which are normally close uh, to the edges. So on the first, uh, the first process uh, is when the chimpanzee basically hit the nuts with a perfect uh, orthogonal movement. Uh, in this case, there is, there is no contact uh, between stones. Uh, 
basically the hammer doesn't impact uh, the anvil and uh, all the force is just absorbed uh, by the nut. So I will show you an example. So you can see that the, the chimpanzee cracks the nut with, uh, without hitting the hammer stones uh, against uh, the anvil. Um, what do we have on the stones? Well, well basically, quartzite is a very hard rock, and this movement or this motion have no significant uh, impact on the rocks. Basically, apart, you can find some residues, but there will be no traces. If instead of using a, a old Dubai quartzite, we use a softer material, this motion, this movement will produce mainly these concavities that we've seen, for example, on the Bosu uh, tools. Another process is where the, when the chimpanzee hits the nut, holding the hammer stone on a 45 degree angle. In this case, as well as the compressive force, there, there will be a contact with the anvil. And, and here we'll see uh, an example uh, of, the, of Subaki performing this uh, movement. So we, you, you have to pay attention. At some point, she will twist a bit her hand and hit the, uh, the hammer against the anvil. You can even hear. You can hear when the the chimpanzee just hit uh, uh, the anvil. Uh, in this case, this will produce also impacts. And in the case of a repetitive contact, a repetitive use of this motion, the anvil will start developing these crash areas on the peripheral. Uh, that crash areas on the peripheral uh, zone of the of the anvil. And of course, the third process uh, is produced when the chimpanzee basically fails the target. Uh, and there is a direct contact, a direct impact, uh, stone against stone. And as, as you can see now in this, in this clip. So the nut, the nut uh, rolls out of the anvil, the chimpanzee hit it, and it is uh, with, when they fail, when basically you can produce, uh, you produce these, these fragments to be detached from the, from the tools. So now that we have uh, tools that have been made on the same raw materials, have been used on pounding activities, so we are nearly ready to answer these questions. So how similar are chimpanzee stone tools, archeological and modern human pounding tools? So we've seen that chimpanzee uh, quartzite uh, tools used to crack nuts normally have similar uh, use wear patterns that the pounding tools found uh, from Old Dubai Gorge. Um, however, when, when we looked also at the human uh, experiments, we noted that there are not only nut cracking, but other activities such as bone breaking or meat tenderizing tend to produce also these similar uh, patterns. Um, in any case, it is, it is very difficult to, to say that the old Dubai anvils was used for nut cracking based only on, on the distribution patterns. But what these patterns uh, from the uh, experimental and the, and the chimpanzee tools are telling us is that at least uh, we can be nearly certain that the old Dubai anvils uh, were used to process uh, organic materials. And this is also corroborated with when we do a quantitative approach. And um, for example, if we look at the density of the use wear marks and the percentage of the uh, surface, the surface covered by percussive mark, and we compare the data from the, the three groups, the old Dubai, modern humans, and Kumamoto uh, experiments, we can see that the, uh, the archeological tools has normally similar values to the captive chimpanzee pounding tools and the anvils used to crack uh, open nuts by modern humans and also uh, do the, the perform the, the bone breaking. So from the point of view of a quantitative, uh, 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 or the quantitative approach, uh, the old Dubai anvils mo most likely were used to, uh, uh, to process uh, organic material. Uh, so therefore the, the, the selected Archaeological pounding tools seems to have this uh, this correlation with uh, the soft uh, soft materials uh, being processed. So, but 
in any case, there is a still a major research question uh, in which primatology and, and archaeology also meets. And we know that chimpanzees occasionally produce fragments that can have the same morphological features than the napping flakes uh, produced by hominins, as well as we know that capuchin uh, do with this stone-on-stone -stone, uh, behavior. Uh, and recently discoveries have shown that 3.3 million years ago, hominins were also napping stone tools. But could we consider bounding activities as the previous stage that lead to the emergence of a stool, tool flaking? Well, this is something that we can discuss later and I think it will continue to be discussed during the following years. Uh, in any case, I guess, um, uh, as I mentioned before, also primatology can help archaeology not only to model hominin behavior, but also we can use primates to understand the function that the, the function that uh, the archaeological stone tools uh, had in the course of human evolution. You need to understand that for you primatologists, uh, it's very easy. Just go on the field, observe a behavior, and pick up the stone. But for archaeologists, we don't have the behavior. So we, we only deal with the rocks. So try to uh, identify the behavior based only on, on the last use of a rock is pretty difficult. So <laughs> that's why we are so interested on, on all this, this primate world. Because for the first time, we can observe a behavior and study the, the, the tool. In any case, the, there is still a lot to do. Uh, it is essential to continue expanding the analysis to uh, other primate tools, as well as behaviors, not, not just not cracking, but include the digging, uh, seed pounding. Uh, also, uh, understand the archaeological signature that these primate behaviors can have uh, across the, the landscape. And in general, uh, primate archaeology, despite uh, of being a recent uh, discipline, it, it works and it has a lot of potential for further studies, uh, but it is essential uh, that both we, both we archaeologists and you primatologists, we, we should speak the same language uh, and use the, the common protocols of, of analysis. So we can always compare uh, the data across the species or understand the usual information processes that can help us uh, to identify those activities that can be hidden in the archaeological record. Uh, in this line, for example, we are currently increasing the, the number of species that are using quartzite from all the way gourds. Uh, so we've sent now uh, quartzite to be used uh, by macaques uh, in Thailand and, and here to be used by these uh, capuchin monkeys. Uh, so therefore, uh, we have now a large reference collection of tools used by different species, different primates made on the same raw material collected from the same uh, sources that can be directly uh, compared. Uh, in this case, this is still an ongoing uh, study, so hopefully we will be able to show the, the re results fairly, fairly soon. And to conclude, uh, I just want to stress that primatology uh, has shown archaeologists that we humans uh, are not anymore the only tool users or tool makers. Uh, and with all these new findings and our understanding that nowadays we have of this primate tool use, uh, I think that this quote by Leakey, uh, now we must redefine tool, redefine man, or accept chimpanzees uh, as human, uh, should be rephrased. Um, as not only chimpanzees, uh, but also other primates, in fact, are complex tool users, and, and certainly they can be useful. Uh, they can be very useful to model uh, past hominin uh, behavior. And of course, uh, I would like to thank uh, Thiago for helping us to organize uh, the field season in this wonderful place. And you Brazilians, you have probably the most, <laughs> uh, the most beautiful uh, place that I've never seen, which is the, the Serra da, uh, da Capribara. So uh, thank you very much. Muy obrigado. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you for the, the talk, Adrian. Uh, it, it, it's more a, a curiosity. Uh, do you have any instances where um, flakes or f uh, flaked, um, flaked rocks can be, especially when they, they are not inside the site itself, when they are kind of loose on the landscape, so you, you, you don't have a very good control if it's a site or if... Mm -hmm. uh, do, do you have many instances of this kind of things that are in, scattered in a landscape and, and people don't know if they, they are... Uh, they were used or produced by hominins or generally you find it on scatters and it's kind of easy to have uh, some control? Well, in the case, for example, of Old Dubai, uh, they always appear uh, in large, uh, within large assemblages. Okay. So you are not just walking through the landscape and suddenly you see a tool that could be a pounding tool and made by home. Normally, no. Normally, it's found in a context. In, in context, a, yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I, I was just wondering if, like, if, if this was a problem, like, it would be interesting to, to use South America as a, a comparative in a comparative basis, because here we have this pretty much the same geology mm -hmm. in terms of basalts and stuff like this, but here we, we never had uh, great apes. So we never have like large, really large pounding tools like the chimpanzees or, or even the hominins would, would use. And at the same time, we have these rocks in, in deposits that are dated from the tertiary. So we know they, no human, no ape, no, no would mm -hmm. use them. So we, we it, it would be perhaps interesting to have this as a kind of a control because you, you can have the same, pretty much the same raw materials uh, in pretty much the same climate, especially, uh, but with a 100% guarantee that there, there were no apes doing anything on them, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, just a, a, Yeah, I mean, a it, is, it is a very interesting point. In fact, one of the... One, one of the thoughts that I have when I, while I was doing my PhD is that most of the pounding activities the, that hominins may, may have done, we will n never know because they probably did the same as, as monkeys. They just go to a tree, crack some nuts and leave. And for that they need just three or four tools. And if we lose those tools, we will never be uh, able to identify them. So. Um, well, now, now that I know that you co-authored the article on, Le, on the Lomekuan uh, stone industry, may I ask, do they have any of these uh, pounding uh, elements? In, or, the, or? in the Lomekuan? Yeah. Yes, they, they do have uh, quite a number of pounding tools, yeah. So th that is something that I'm trying to push to be to be out, <laughs> so uh, yes, there is uh, there is both. Also, there, there are some cores that uh, on one side has been flaked, and on the opposite side they have some percussive marks. So, but this reuse of, of the same blanks, I've seen it also at Old Dubai and many other sites. So this is something that is quite common within hominins that take a stone and use it for multiple things, for flaking some get some flakes, and then to pound or, or to use it as a hammerstone. So in a way, would you expect uh, these to be different from the classic old one, or? The, the pounding tools, you mean, or? Yeah. Uh, mm, hmm. <laughs> they, they are, there are differences from the, but especially also because of, the, of what they were doing, you know, the, the Lumegui sites. So they were napping in a very particular way, which is with this passive, hammer technique. So those passive elements that were used as passive hammer stones, they have them there. So we have, we managed to identify them. So, and, and normally they, they are not many regular hammer stones. So in that case, you can say that there is a difference between the old one percussive uh, material and the Lomequian tool. So th there are differences.
he says that uh, the, the work is easier for primatologists because they, they can see the behavior, but uh, on the other hand, the archaeologists can play music at the field site. <laughs> <laughs> that is true, that is true. We, yeah. There was one day we went with Tiago just for a field trip, that normally field trip that primatologists do, and we nearly die. So <laughs> I'd rather stick with the archaeology, play music, and excavate in a site. <laughs> Not even, we, we didn't even follow but, the monkey. But trying to fit the stunts together is fun. I, I had only one experience in <laughs> archaeology, but it was quite fun. <laughs> uh, any more questions? So then we are moving on to Mercedes Okumura from uh, the Institute of Biosciences. So she will discuss the differences between uh, and the difference and potential similarities between uh, human and capuchin lytic tools from Serra da Capivara, and how to integrate the studies in a multidisciplinary perspective. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for coming. I'm going to read this, otherwise I'll get carried away and we only have a one-day symposium, right? So we want to stick to the time. So today I'll be presenting the work developed in collaboration with Fabio Parenti, Alan Canel, Evelyn Debat and Martine Farr uh, regarding the genesis and taphonomy of the archaeological layers of Pedra Furada rock shelter. So this is located at the Serra da Capivara National Park. And I will also discuss how the archaeological data from this region should now be reevaluated, taking into account the stone to, to use that has been described for uh, capuchin monkeys in the region. For more than 20 years, the region of the Serra da Capivara National Park, located in Piauí State, northeastern Brazil, has been the focus of a harsh debate on place to see evidence in South America, mainly centered on the evidence of the reference site, the Boqueirão da Pedra Furada Rock Shelter, which is this one here. And this is the position of the Boqueirão da Pedra Furada site in relation to the Sandstone Cuesta and the nearby rock shelter of Sitio do Meio, which is another archaeological site. The main discussion here is the evidence for a human Pleistocene occupation of the site, which presented C14 datings revealing a human occupation dating back to the limits of the radiocarbon dating technique. This is about 40 to 60,000 years before present. Since 1974, the Serra da Capivara National Park and its surroundings have been intensively studied from a multidisciplinary approach, recording, among others, several sites presenting Pleistocene paleontological and archaeological remains. In particular, since 2008, research under the direction of Eric Boeda has been conducted with the aims of replicating and refining the data obtained at the Boqueirão da Pedra Furada site and uh, discovering new evidence of human Pleistocene occupation in the region. Boqueirão da Pedra Furada was excavated between 1978 and 1988, and although the results have been exhaustively published since 2001, many recent publications do not even consider the above-mentioned data, preferring to focus their critiques on a generic and conjectural set of taphonomic and technological remarks, or even naively ignoring the existence of the site itself when considering the issue of a pre-Paleo-Indian 
Pleistocenic occupation in South America. Such researchers have been proposing that what we have been considering as archaeological artifacts, so human-made uh, uh, stone tools, would be in fact rocks naturally broken by gravity. Although the stone tools that we describe are in fact quite simple, they do present features which would be difficult to be explained by being the result of natural, non-human flaking, as we will show later. Meanwhile, several research programs have focused on complementary aspects of the main debated issue, meaning the hypothesis of a human colonization of the Americas during the place to sin. Among these uh, aspects, we can list the, uh, a huge array of genetic studies that aim at tracing the origin of population stocks and the timing of their dispersals, generally admitting a first colonization event not older than 20,000 years before present. Two, a model of two settlement waves based on cranial morphology. Three, new archaeologically consistent and well-dated pre-Clovis Pleistocenic sites, archaeological sites. Four, the role of Beringia refugia during the last glacial maximum as a cradle of American population waves. And five, a rebirth of the hypothesis of a North Atlantic Ice Age coastal entry route in North America, which is called the Solutron Hypothesis. To add to this debate, there has been recently the discovery of platyrrhine monkeys as battering and flaking agents in the Brazilian lowlands. In the background of the criticisms advanced about the Pleistocene sites in Serra da Capivara region, we are well aware that the core issue is the taphonomic and contextual analysis of each specific set of evidence. So today we'll be presenting three new sets of data concerning the formation processes at Boqueirão da Pedra Furada site. The first is a statistical comparison between the natural fracture of quartz co cobbles from the base of the western talus cone and the artifacts recovered in the excavations in order to rule out any natural action in the making of the archaeological assemblage. The second set of data is a comparison between the, granulo the granulometry of the filling and the composition of some representative features of Pleistocene units to make sure that such archaeological stone structures are not the result of a natural accumulation. And the third, and perhaps the most important one, given our symposium, is a synopsis of the main uh, technical parameters observed on lithic stone tools compared to the naturally, naturally broken stones from the taluscon and to the available data of unintentional flaked stones made by monkeys. So these are the sessions of the same stone wall on the top and the situation uh, of the, the talus cones and the excavations in 1990. A first comparison between the two sets was established on the basis of the observation of 2,000 cobbles from the three talus cones, so A, B, and C, which I'm, not, I'm pretty sure that is not going to work, but no, no. Yeah. Advanced technology, you see. Uh, so from the three talus cones, A, B, and C, which you can see there. Uh, in synthesis, during the 1987 and 1988 excavations, any artifacts in the sheltered area were collected as long as they complied with the criteria of at least one clear flake scar for the flake pieces, the cores, and for the touched pieces, the, the, the flakes, the presence of an evident platform and bulbar uh, surface.
So here we statistically compare the stones from Talos con A, uh, considered as presenting a natural, non-anthropogenic origin, and the Boqueirão da Pedra Furada excavated material, considered as having an anthropogenic origin. The Boqueirão da Pedra Furada sample includes materials from both the Holocene and from the Pleistocene units. And our hypothesis is that there are important differences between stones from Talos con A, the, the natural broken ones, and Boqueirão da Pedra Furada artifacts. So the sample from Talos con A consisted of complete and broken cobbles, natural flakes, and fragments, which are defined as pieces of rock that do not present common flake features like a bulb, a platform, or a sharp edge. Elements greater than 32 millimeters were suitable for the analysis, and the archaeological pieces consisted in cores and flakes, either retouched or not. So the following variables were analyzed for broken pebbles and for cores. Um, and the first one is, is the one that I'm going to present here, which is the number of bulb scars larger than one centimeter. So uh, the materials from Talos con A, so the natural flaked materials, do not present more than four flake scars while archaeological materials present the full range of such uh, feature here. Um, there were significant differences in the proportion of the number of bulb scars between Talos con A and the archaeological layers. And in fact, it's uh, possible to observe that 81% of the pebbles from, from the natural broken uh, uh, thing uh, present only one bulb scar, while the same attribute can be observed in around 5% of Pleistocene and Holocene cores. Granulometric information regarding materials from Talos con A and the archaeological site is presented here. There were significant differences between the proportions of the samples uh, from both Talos con A and between the Pleistocene and Holocene materials and the comparison between the proportions of the talus cone and the Pleistocene materials revealed significant differences. And finally, there is a complete absence of flakes from the talus cone presenting non-cortical platform while the opposite pattern can be observed in archaeological materials. The non-cortical platform can be used as a proxy for uh, more than one flaking event, and it's proxy, so my, my Latin is, is wrong here. Uh, when comparing the pieces from Talos Con and from the archaeological layers, it's possible to state that there are significant differences between the frequencies observed for the analyzed variables in natural pieces and in the ones we assumed anthropogenic from the archaeological layers. Such differences in the proportion of features between the natural and archaeological materials can be observed in the anal analyzed variables. So these differences between natural and archaeological materials revealed by the statistical analysis, supports our hypothesis that endogenous raw materials from both Pleistocene and Holocene layers from Boqueron da Pedra Furada are from a different origin, meaning they're from anthropogenic origin, when compared to the natural materials from Talos con A. For illustrating the relationship between archaeological features and the sedimentary matrix of the filling of the site, we choose some well-defined stone structures from Pleistocene layers as described. All the selected features are not only well inside the drip line, but also in upslope position, frontally opposed to the talus slope. 
the lithological composition of these structures, so the proportion between quartz cobbles and sandstone slabes is variable, but all their elements are concentrated and clearly larger than the sedimentary matrix, excluding the possibility of deposition due to hydraulic transport from the rock, rock fall, so from the, from the talus cone. Among the relevant structures from Pedra Furada III phase, we unearthed structure uh, 67, a very large stone pile composed of 515 cobbles and 102 sandstone blocks elongated in a north-south direction, and bordered on its western side by a darkened circular area presenting charcoals dated at 19,300 uh, uncalibrated years before presence. Such a structure was found in the inner portion of the shelter. Besides the presence of these above mentioned structures that very likely resulted from anthropogenic deposition, a dimensional analysis of a cross section from north to south was also performed on structure 67. A, a total of 617 cobbles presenting a maximum dimension of 240 millimeters were analyzed. Not only there is a weak correlation between the size of the stones and the distance from the actual fall, but their distribution is random with no apparent differentiation from, by, by the slope. Moreover, the whole structure is dipping opposite to the talus slope. That means that we can reject the hypothesis that these stones were carried and sorted by gravity related to the distance from the rock fall. The distribution of these stones according to the maximum length is shown here on the graph. And this, this should work, yeah. Um, and there is a marked preference for stones with, with a maximum length of uh, uh, between eight and 10 centimeters which is very different from the granulometry of the filling. Okay, let's go to the monkeys now. Uh, I, I don't have any, any nice videos for you, unfortunately. In the last decades, cognitive and structural capabilities of non-human primates have been largely studied, leading to a review of the former more anthropocentric view asserting that two use is a unique human feature. A large body of research has documented two use in old world hominins, but less attention has been paid to the two use behavior of platyrrhine monkeys of the new world until the end of the 20th century. Stone tool using behavior in captive cebus was systematically documented from the first half of the 20th century onwards. And the use of tools by capuchin monkeys in the Caatinga and Cerrado environment of Southern Piauí has been intensively studied since at least 2007, showing a very rich and diversified behavior regarding to use. In parallel, a new body of research has been developed in order to study the material remains of non-human primates, instrumental in social activities, leading to the creation of a true non-human primate archaeology, first developed on the present African chimpanzee territory and after also extended to other places, including northeastern Brazil and notably in the Serra da Capivara region. However, one of the challenges is the scarcity of primate fossil remains, which often prevent any reliable attribution of authorship to a specific artifact assemblage. In the Serra da Capivara region, despite the copious upper place to see the fossil assemblage, consisting in, mo consisting in more than 7,000 faunal remains of about 60 species, proceeding from 12 paleontological sites, primate fossil remains are absent, except for one tooth of Aloata from Toca do Barrigudo site. 
A Luata SP has also been reported in the Toca dos Ossos Cave in Norolândia, Bahia State. And also in Bahia State, a new species of Aluata, Aluata mauroi, has been described in the late Upper Pleistocene site of Gruta dos Brejões, in Morro do Chapéu. Two fossilized specimens of Atelini were discovered in 1992 in the Pleistocene site of Toca da Boa Vista, also in Bahia, which is about 300 kilometers southeastern from Serra da Capivara Park. One of the skeletons has been attributed to Protopithecus brasiliensis, defined in the fossiliferous deposits of Lagoa Santa, Minas, Lagoa Santa, Minas Gerais State. The other was described as a new genus and new species, Caipora bamborium, an atelini possibly reaching a body mass of 20 kilograms. Recently, uh, Alenar reviewed Protopithecus brasiliensis and reassessed the almost complete skeleton from the Toca da Boa Vista site, defining it as a new genus, a new species, Cartelis coimbra filho, presenting a body mass of about 25 to 28 kilograms. Besides this discovery, uh, paleontolog paleontological data are meager. Without going to the details of the Cebid phylogen phylogenetic relationship and dispersal, the ancestor of the Cebini presently living in northeastern Brazil is unknown. Luis Ramoni and colleagues recently published the discovery of a Pleistocene molar tooth of a Cebid from Venezuela, being the first definit definitive evidence of capuchin monkeys in the South American fossil record. We do not know yet when Sabine colonized in northeastern Brazil, so it's impossible to confirm their presence in the upper place to see. Haslan and, and colleagues dated stone anvils probably used by Sabine about 600, Sabine, sorry, about 600 and 700 years ago in the Serra da Capivara Park. But it's still far from clear if they lived in this region during the upper place to see. At present, Sabini are the only known platyrrhine monkeys using stone hammers. Do they have the monopoly of this behavior? We know that in Africa, several Catarrhine primates, including early hominins, homo apes, had and have this behavior. So we wonder if in South America, the large-sized extinct Atelini also showed this behavior. Demonstrating this will be a great contribution to the knowledge of the anthropoid platyrrhine evolution. Currently, capuchin monkeys frequently feed at the bottom of the sandstone wall, where cobbles for smashing nuts of various species are very common. They also repeatedly smash quartz cobbles in outcropping conglomerate layers inside the sandstone cuesta. In these activities, they use quartz cobbles as hammerstones, sometimes unintentionally producing cores and flakes, some of them with human-like intentional flaking features, such as concave negative scars on cobbles, uh, the angle between the platform and the ventral surface of the flakes is greater than 90 degrees, resembling the flakes produced in, by humans, and also the presence of flake scars on, dorsal, on the dorsal face of flakes. As very correctly stated by Fido in, in 2017, in a comment on the Prophet and colleagues' uh, publication from 2016, the stone remains produced by these primates can mimic the simplest elements of the lithic assemblage recovered in the Serra da Capivara region in both the Pleistocene and the Holocene layers. Because equifinality of unintentional stone flaking by neotropical primates is an important novelty, we believe that the entire lithic production on endogenous raw material from this region should be reconsidered in the light of this important paradigm shift. 
In order to distinguish between the monkeys and the supposed anthropogenic lithic collection of Boqueirão da Pedra Furada sites, an initial comparison between the two assemblages is presented. The bulk of the Pedra Furada toolkit is composed by very simple trimmed cores, quartz fragments with macro retouches, and very clear, uh, well-made flakes. In this comparison, only data collection from the surface was used, as the possibility that they are excavated artifacts had an anthropic origin is not, in our opinion, completely ruled out in the Serra da Capivara region. The most evident difference between the two sets is the mass. Archaeological artifacts are two or three times heavier than the monkey artifacts for cores and flaked pieces in general, and three to four times for flakes. Holocene archaeological flakes are on average lighter and smaller because of the intense snapping of cores. It's also important to note that the average mass values of archaeological shoppers and cores lie mostly around the 300 to 500 grams mark, similar to Pleistocene and artifact, uh, similar to Pleistocene artifact values. The mass distribution of both the Pleistocene and Holocene assemblages at Boqueirão da Pedra Furada also shows striking similarities strongly suggesting that there was a technological continuum in the endogenous raw material selection and to uh, preparation. Besides the stone tool using in multiple tasks by monkeys, we should also consider the possibility that these animals could have produced rock piles similar to those previously defined as anthropic structures in Boqueirão da Pedra Furada. Stone throwing from proceptive females was reported by Falotico and Ottoni as a provocative behavior during estrus, but no stone accumulation or storage places related to capuchin monkeys have been currently observed observe it in Serra da Capivara. However, when considering the possibility that monkeys could have contributed to the site formation, some points concerning the lithic assemblage of units at Boqueirão da Pedra Furada should be kept in mind. Unambiguous hammer stones have not been recovered in any of the Pleistocene Boqueirão da Pedra Furada layers. Several putative specimens have one or more, not spatially constrained, incipient Hertzian cones on the cortical surface, but none exhibited repeated, crushed, and concentrated micropitting on a restricted surface. These are the features commonly attributed to and used to define hammerstones and could be clearly associated to percussive activities of monkeys. However, the typical pitted depressions resulting from repeated uh, nut-cracking percussions made by monkeys were never observed on the sandstone blocks found in the archaeological layers of Boqueirão da Pedra Furada. The observation of dorsal scars on flakes allow us to discriminate between the rock fall and the intentional uh, flaking. For this reason, the secondary use of flakings, including retouching or, or, or cutting activities not observed so far in, in, in wild monkeys, can be a very important factor in ascertaining the nature of a given assemblage. The many flakes and quartz fragments with marginal retouch recovered from well inside the rock shelter and dated from the upper Pleistocene and, and Holocene, therefore should ought to be carefully recons reconsidered and analyzed. And as an example here, we present three quartz flakes with marginal retouch.
these tools, you know, they are difficult to handle. So basically here what we want to show are these flakes with the retouches and in this sense for these more complex uh, made pieces, we, we are ruling out uh, that they could be made either uh, by gravity, like natural broken pieces, or by, by the monkey. So these are three good examples of retouched uh, flakes. It is worth noting that at Boqueron da Pedra Furada itself, the conglomerate presenting the cobbles used by monkeys is not exposed, and loose cobbles are the only available are only available to be used by the monkeys on, on the rockfall talus. Therefore, their use as hammerstones would have implied a minimum transport of about 10 meters. Thus, a more probably work site for the monkey smashing activity would have been at the large sandstone blocks of the Talus uh, Sea. But in this case, any byproducts would have probably rolled downstream, possibly polluting the outer session of the Boqueirão da Pedra Furada site, which is another site named Vale da Pedra Furada. We agree that the multifunctional nature of the observed monkey toolkit is a true mimesis of a simple core and flake technology made by humans. And because of this, the anthropogenic origin of a single, simple artifact cannot be precisely ascertained. We should also take into account the low sedimentation rate recorded at the Boqueirão da Pedra Furada site which is on average one centimeter every century, which allows for the multiple reutilization of the same tool, potentially by monkeys or humans. Therefore, a given assemblage would only be recognizable on a statistical basis after a careful analysis of shiny operatoire and useware studies. However, we still consider that, the most, that, that most of the more complex tools from Boqueirão da Pedra Furada assemblage can be regarded as the result of intentional flaking by humans. So here we show some cobbles. Uh, uh, here we show two shoppers from the oldest Pleistocene layers, and again, the number of flakes that were removed from these shoppers and, and other technological uh, features made it very unlikely to be either natural or monkey-made uh, shoppers. And here we have three cores from the most recent Pleistocene layer. These artifacts present technical features that could hardly be attributed to gravitational fracture or the occasional percussion by monkeys. In this talk, we revised the formation of the Pedra Furada deposit, highlighting the main physical agent seen as the principal alternative to the anthropic origin of endogenous artifact assemblages, meaning the, the rockfall. On this basis, we compare the granulometry of the western uh, of the talus A with that of the lithic assemblage, including some important stone structures from Pleistocene units, demonstrating that both did not result from the falls, but on the contrary, were selected, transported, flaked, or dispose it well inside the sheltered area. Given the well-studied use of stone tools by wild capuchin monkeys in the Pedra Furada area, we show also an initial preliminary comparison between the unintentional cores and flakes currently produced by these primates, and the artifacts recovered and considered as having an anthropic origin both from the Holocene and Pleistocene layers of the site. 
This comparison allows us to ascertain that part, although not necessarily the totality, of the archaeological assemblage could, could be the result of, mon of monkey's activity, but also that some important technical traits of the artifacts, along with the evidence for several stone structures, still present a very strong case for a long-lasting Pleistocene human presence in this region. We are perfectly aware that Boqueirão da Pedra Furada, as all its analogs, needs to be studied in its archaeological and natural context, and not only with a site-centered focus. It's known that Boqueirão da Pedra Furada is not an isolated case, as previous works and ongoing research are demonstrating. From the time when it was dismissed by leading archaeologists as a possible collection of geofacts without any careful examination of the evidence, the Pleistocene layers of Boqueirão da Pedra Furada have been ignored, even by scholars academically debating on, Ple on Pleistocene colonization of lowland South America. In addition, ethologists are now trying to produce evidence for a pre-Columbian presence of monkey activity in order to develop the exciting new field of non-human primate archaeology in the Neotropic. These studies should consider existing data on archaeological and stratigraphic context as a useful tool for further discussion on this interesting research topic. If there is indeed any evidence of a long-lasting overlapping coexistence of humans and monkeys in the same region, it is time to build a well-founded research strategy, including both non-human primate and human archaeology, in order to achieve a full understanding of past cultural and ecological adaptations in lowland South America. And here I would like to thank the IA for organizing this, Eduardo Toni for the invitation. Uh, it's so nice that they are here in person, so I can tell a big thank you to Profit and Falotico for kindly providing us with the data, which we use it to uh, run this preliminary analysis and compare humans and, and, and monkeys. And well, and thank you for listening and May I advertise the article where this data has been published so you can check it later. Thank you. You, you can ask me later. Uh, Oh, wow, well, I'm, I'm happy that you published this. Uh, it took a long time, but in the other hand, if, if it were not by the research done by Eduardo and, and Tiago and, and colleagues, um, I think this third part would, wouldn't uh, exist. So it's really nice because uh, it's, it's been a long time. It's a late uh, answer to, to criticisms made in the 80s. Uh, but I think it's a very nice answer, and I hope uh, this article uh, put people to rethink, you know, because uh, it was only uh, like, I think this, I think that, and I think it's not, and I think it is, and now you have uh, quantitative data, so I think it's a really good uh, contribution. So congratulations for you and Fabio. Wow, it's our work, but anyway, uh, we get paid to do this, you know. Uh, I think that it's really nice because uh, first the debate was very boring, like is it natural or it's not? And now you have the monkey activity which adds a lot of excitement. No, but I'm, I'm serious because, I mean, when you look at the assemblage, you really, if you give me like a flake, you really cannot rule out that that flake was made by a monkey. But when you look at the assemblage, then you get really uh, a, a good statistical basis to say, well, most of it indicates that it's really anthropogenic, human-made uh, uh, stone tools. Uh, 
so so I'm, I'm not complaining. It's it's really really exciting, and I'm looking forward to have more more data from monkeys to to compare and 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 add to the discussion. You know. Are these tools dated? Yes, they are. It's gone. Can, yeah. So part of the the big discussion about Boqueron da Pedra Furada, it's related to the very old datings. So so apparently, you cannot have anything older than 12,000, 12, you know, uh, because apparently Americas did not exist before that. So there is a big resistance uh, in, in, in the academy to accept older dates uh, for archaeological sites in the Americas. So Boqueron da Pedra Furada is the best example of this. You have a very nice sequence of dates that go all the way from the Holocene up to what would be the limits of the radiocarbon uh, dating technique, you see. And it's really mind-blowing. Not everyone is really open-minded to look at this and to check the data, to check how it was excavated, and to look at the artifacts and, and, and really, I don't know, be willing to discuss this. I mean, we cannot ignore this. That's, that's the point. And it has been ignored. If you, if you, even if you, when you go, I'm not even saying textbooks, but you go to conferences and a lot of people begin their talks like America was colonized around 12,000 years ago. I mean, come on, people, really? So that's that. These, these are the the datings of the site, and that's why that it's a very uh, polemical. Uh, Consider it as a problematic site. I don't think it's problematic. I think that it's fascinating that we can have this occupation. Is that somehow related to Niet Gidon's research? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that was the research uh, coordinated by Fabio Parenti, the main author of, of the article. And, and yes, and Niedi, yes, she, 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 she's the main archaeologist. I'm happy to know. I always liked her research. <laughs> Thank you. That was a, a really interesting talk. Um, I have two questions, just, just two questions. And they're about um, the, the primate fossils that you were talking about and about the... Um, uh, yeah, the... Yes, these these guys. Um, do you, is, is there is there? Um, I, I don't know. I don't know anything about this. Okay, oh, so. me neither. I'm okay, not. A, I'm not okay. a paleontologist. Okay, then maybe okay, maybe this is a long question to ask. No, no, no. Go ahead. Um, is there any reason why there are so few primate fossils found in this area? Is it due to preservation or due to Latin, um, poor preservation of bones, or is it uh, lack of fossilization in the area, or? Both. Or people aren't looking for them, or, or you know. No, I don't think so. Uh, well, you are in a tropical country, which is really not very nice mm -hmm. to organic uh, preservation. But on the other hand, when you go to the northeast, you have a lot of paleontological sites where the preservation is actually really good. But also, we have to take into account the different habits of of the different species. So some species they might be more prone to, to be preserved, depending on the environment that they are living. So that's the only explanation for this complete, almost complete absence of, of primate fossils in the, in the region. And it's a shame, because it will be very interesting to it would, it would be very cool. think if any of these big guys you know would be like pounding things. And yeah. Um, and then my second question uh, is, and again, this is something that I, I don't know about because um, embarrassingly, I haven't, I don't think I've read up enough about the, the Pedro Ferrada material. Uh, is the, the, 
the, the cave, the, the rock shelter paintings on the walls. There are paintings of capuchins, of, of these monkeys on those rock shelters. Do you know the age of those paintings? Are they, are they dated? Can they be dated? Are they, is there an age limit or a range? Or? Okay, that, that could be another symposium. <laughs> okay, fine. Dating <laughs> rock art. It's very difficult. Yeah. There are some articles that have been published on the dating of these rock arts from, from the, the, the National Park. But, yeah, it, it's, it's complicated. Not all the datings are reliable, and, well, the techniques are also, also very complicated. So we really don't know. It would be lovely to, to check, you know, the, the monkeys on the rock art and, and to figure out from uh, a, a better chronology for them. But. So there's no, there's no kind of age range for that rock art? There's no... Astolfo wants to talk. Um, if, if uh, the, probably the, the, the capuchin figure, figurines, figures are inside some uh, uh, tradition, uh, rock art tradition, and uh, I have a colleague that could answer you about the, the, the possible range. Uh, that is uh, Marilia. Well, I can ask her and I can give you, but I, I don't know. Yeah, but, but the dating would be based on... On the rock slabs, on certain positions, so it's possible to have a range, of course. Yeah, but... Rock art. Yeah, but... No, mine neither, as you can see. But in a way, it's also something based on stylistic uh, features, so... I can tell you Holocene, that, that's, that's, that's it. Um, uh, is because uh, of this question about rock art, um, uh, I remember I, I read, had, um, read something about this. Even in that Cambridge rock art, something about uh, the name uh, from Paul Ben, I think so, is a book. Um, there's a lot of problems related to how can you date a rock art and in relation to the uh, archaeological sites in Serra da Capivara is mainly because of the material used to do uh, the rock paintings. Um, but some, sometimes they, uh, researchers could uh, also uh, find some material and during the excavation, and it was possible to be dated. Uh, in this book, there is one, just one um, pointed data, uh, 17, 17 old years, you know, is very interesting, but there are a lot of others, uh, how can I say, examples of uh, data in these sites, ancient and older than this. Um, there is this problem of uh, the material that uh, avoid you to data correctly, to to uh, can uh, give you a correct data. But there is other examples, interesting examples that you can uh, be approximated uh, a data, a, 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 a kind of data that could be correlated with the, uh, uh, okay, people that was living there. For example, I, I think it's the Situ, Situ do Meio, I think so, that they uh, excavated, excavated, and the picture continued to appear uh, on the rock. And during the excavated, uh, until one meter, I think so, or more than this, you could see pictures, like, uh, continuously on the rock, so it was in uh, uh, safe uh, uh, in the beginning, very beginning of Holocene. It's interesting. Hi, thank you for the talk. 
So uh, just about the the captain presence in, in the in the Serra da Capivara. So now we had now the some data about three thousand years of the stone material for the captain monkeys, but we do have some data about the the split of the species of the subspecies and that's now a species that's Sapajus libidinosus from uh, molecular work that's uh, around fifty thousand years of the split of the Apella and Libidinosus genus. So that's probably the, the time frame when the, the species diversify in the Katinga region. So it's probably during this time frame of 40, 50,000 years that this, this species, this particular species come to be in the, in the region. I don't know, maybe there's other primates before that. <laughs> we don't know, <laughs> but there's no fossils. Uh, just one side question that came to my mind, because you mentioned uh, uh, evidence of human presence based on tools um, around uh, 60,000 years in the past. Because I remember last time I talked to Niedi, uh, I was getting used to this date, but she mentioned something even, even earlier, like 100,000 uh, years, uh, and that's based on what kind of evidence? Yeah. So that was a thermoluminescence uh, dating that was made on, on burnt uh, stones from the same structure, and then they range it from 80,000 to 100,000. Uh, it has been published, but the main author sort of it's not it's not quite sure about it. So I had a slide with this and I decided to take it out because people are really not quite sure about this, this dating, but in a way it makes no difference. If people cannot accept 60,000, it's unlikely that they will be happy with 100,000. Anyway, so, so yeah, there are these, these, these datings. They, they have been published, but we, yeah, they, they're not very, Certain, you know. Okay. okay. And thank you, Mercedes. <laughs> so, well, we can have more questions at the, at the end for every speaker. But now uh, we move on, but last but not least, to Astolfo Araujo from the Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology at USP, who will discuss the current convergences and divergences between archaeology, the, very, the good old human archaeology, and primate archaeology, and to the broader issues related to the ethological approach to culture as a broader evolutionary process. Yeah, things, things are becoming complicated. Formerly it was just archaeology. Now we have primate, human primate archaeology and non-human primate archaeology. Yeah, it's not easy. Eh? Well, um, first I would like to thank Eduardo Toni. Uh, I consider... Uh, the Institute of Advanced Studies as my second home. I spent here uh, one, one year, a sabbatical year, here, which was a wonderful time for me. And uh, also, I am uh, I am a big fan of the Institute's videos because you will see like this, this symposium will be uh, available. And also, there are several other symposiums that are very interesting and debating the questions about uh, evolution and culture, uh, uh, humanity and animality. So I, I, I think you should really go to the, the, to the web page and, and see the other talks that are uh, really important. So uh, I will start this presentation talking about uh, a man that uh, was a, way ahead of his time and whose ideas were buried beneath several layers of debris 
composed mainly by religious assumptions and humanistic self-deception. And this man is French philosopher Michel de Montaigne. Montaigne's essays are delightful to read and full of surprises, especially when you realize you are reading something written by a 17th century nobleman. Montaigne is centuries ahead when he compares the suffering of humans and animals, and centuries ahead when he says, when I play with my cat, how do I know that she's not playing with me rather than I with her? So this, 17th century. Uh, this is the idea, oh guy, you have to wait. This is the idea of symmetry several centuries before Bruno Latour, and in my view, much deeper than Latour's ideas because Montaigne talks about symmetry between humans and other animals, and not symmetry between humans and others, which comprise both animals and inanimate objects. In my view, when you read the discourse saying that we have to acknowledge symmetry between humans, airplanes, and the hole in the ozone layer, our conscious brain says, cool, cool, that's it, but unconsciously we put uh, airplanes uh, and cats as the other, because we know airplanes are just machines, the ozone layer is just invisible stuff, and cats are just animals, so everything boils down to rhetorics. So I think that Montaigne went much further than Latour. Of course, Montaigne's view about animals uh, were not, was not easily accepted and was criticized by René Descartes, the guy several people love to hate, and we archaeologists owe the coordinate system so dear for plotting our findings, but whose ideas about animals as biological machines incapable of reasoning uh, are famous. Unfortunately, the tendency of, human, of the human brain to seek dichotomies in everything tended to portray Descartes as a kind of monstrous mind, responsible for saying that animals were unable to feel in pain, vivisecting animals and kicking pregnant dogs. These things happened, but it was not his fault. Other guys did that. Uh, we have to be cautious because it's hard to believe such an intelligent person as Descartes could incur in such a gross error. In fact, Descartes' writings and correspondence shows that his views about animals were somewhat ambiguous. This is important to say. Descartes even have, had a dog called Monsieur Grat and was very affectionate to his dog. So I think he was not a monster, anyway. It is true, though, that Descartes' followers, such as Malebranche, held Curious views about animals. They eat without pleasure, cry without pain, grow without knowing it. They desire nothing, fear nothing, know nothing. However, we should be condescendent with Malbranche. He was a Catholic priest, so you can understand. But the question remains, why the hell such intelligent people incur in such a gross error? I believe the explanation is twofold. First, it has to do with the naturalistic explanations of the world that came with the Renaissance, and as an upshot of this, with the advance of humanism. The traditional view of the role that Descartes and late, later philosophers played on the question of the opposition between humans and nature tend to portray him, portray them actually, as scholars with a very clear mechanistic view of the world and full of certainties. Like they were right, they were sure of what they were saying. Uh, however, recent authors, for instance, Sharp 2011, tend to put this in a very different perspective. Instead of certitude, it is possible to perceive in authors such as Descartes and Spinoza, ambivalence and anxiety. Sharp proposes that the early modern view of the world, seeking to explain phenomena without resourcing to supernatural instances, was responsible for a permeable, gray zone, dangerous, no man's land between humans and non-human animals. Anatomy, physiology, behavioral observations, everything pointed to the startling similarities between humans and other animals. This led to the necessity to start building some kind of wall. 
Hence, the wall was not built because the difference between humans and other animals became clearer. Rather, the wall was built because the difference between humans and other animals became diffuse. Without a naturalistic view of the world, so before this Renaissance, uh, the, uh, the dangerous gray zone could be avoided by resorting to plain religion. A good example uh, is a diary entry wrote by a Puritan clergyman, Cotton Mather, in uh, 1700. Once he was making water at the wall, that means he was urinating, and a dog came and did the same, the same wall. Right? So he had some no? The clergyman thought, what mean and vile things are the children of man? How much do our natural necessities abase us and place us on the same level of the very dogs? He solved this problem by devoting himself to noble and religious thoughts every time he went to fulfill his physiological needs. Philosophers, on the other hand, were seeking for rational arguments, even if they were religious persons, such as the case, case of Descartes and Spinoza. No wonder that their anxiety could not be solved by elevated thoughts while seated in a latrine. The only rational alternative was to build a wall and some trenches just in case. The trenches are many, and as in an old battlefield, we can still see them in the landscape. The older ones are a bit covered with grass and already shallow. The more recent are quite fresh and periodically maintained. The older trenches are humans were created as an image of God while other animals not. Or only humans have souls. More recently, other trenches were added. Only humans have reasoning. Only humans use tools, only humans play, only humans lose, only humans cry, only humans work, only humans are self-aware, only humans have agency, only humans have possessed the capacity for symbolism, and so on. We can also say that only platypus lay eggs and breastfeed their offspring. So another example of... Now, it's imperative to define humanism for the purposes of this talk. Humanism is not about being a nice person, nor about being devoted to the arts or a student of humanities. Humanism is a creed, or a religion, if you will, based on some myth. The foremost is the myth of progress, or progressive development of the beings, or progressive amelioration of stuff. This notion is so deeply ingrained in our thoughts that we are committing major Freudian slips all the time. You turn on the TV and see the progress of the driving or the progress of shaving. Doesn't matter how many times one shows the branching nature of the evolution of all species, our species is still regarded by the majority of people as being a line of monkeys walking towards the right, never towards the left. It's interesting and being taller and taller, conquering the upright position and the holy grail of symbolism. A brief parenthesis is that we, modern people, are shorter than our Paleolithic ancestors and also have smaller brains, a tennis ball smaller, 200 milliliters smaller. Reasoning shows that progress is a myth. The question is if we can really incorporate this information or if our brains will keep deceiving us. For those interested on the top topic, I recommend two excellent books, Steve Derenfeld's The Arrogance of Humanism and Gilberto Dupas' The Myth of Progress. Humanism is intimately linked, linked to religion in spite of pretending to be secular. Of course, a humanist can also be an atheist, but the structure of the reasoning is eminently religious. According to British philosopher John Gray, the myth of progress can be traced from the dawn of Christianity with the idea that mankind would go through a historical process and not cyclical anymore. Uh, for instance, the end of suffering with the advent of the Messiah, and that this process would, would be te teleological. Everything would have a final purpose. Such ideas were absent 
in the major religions until then. During the Middle Ages, in the 12th century, Joaquin de Flora would have reinforced this teleological character of Christianity, proposing the idea of the Trinity as a historical process where humanity would go through three stages, starting from the age of the Father, passing through the age of the Son, ultimately attaining the age of the Spirit, a stage where universal fraternity would be the rule until the day of the last judgment. Gray proposes that this idea of phases following three stages had a very strong impact on secular thinking, being perceived in the vision of the evolution of human freedom into the three dialectic, dialectical stages of Hegel, in the idea of three stages of society towards Marx's communism, and in the three stages towards the perfect society through the positivism proposed by Auguste Comte. I would even dare to add two more examples from archaeology, the three stages of humanity, savagery, barbarism, and civilization, proposed by Lewis Henry Morgan, and the three age systems of uh, Christian Thompson, uh, stone, bronze, and iron. So this, uh, we tend to think that uh, uh, we are secular, but a lot of, uh, of, of, of thoughts that is apparently not, not religious is deeply, deeply rooted in religion. This is an, an interesting thing. Progressivism is an optimistic and utopian view in the worst sense of the term, in that it only promotes accommodation based on the belief that everything is under the control, not of any God, but of the human will. This is the vision that, an, an, that animates the main current political ideological systems from Marxism to neoliberalism. It is perhaps one of the most intriguing features of our society. A pretentiously modern dash technological discourse based on a fundamentally religious ontology of an eminently optimistic nature or what my, we may briefly call a humanist stance. In short, humanism is religion without God. Since there is no vacuum of ideas, something is placed in the altar. This something is either humanity itself or science, which is uh, humanity purified. It's uh, important to note that science is welcome if it does not contradict the basic tenets of humanism. Okay, so that would be. Uh, it's easy to see that humanism and the achievements of the Renaissance are responsible for the Berlin Wall between us and the others. So now it's Berlin Wall. Uh, after Game of Thrones, it would be the wall, the 100 meter tall ice barrier between the good people and the wildlings. It protects us from the spiritual death also. It maintains our human accents. Well, the good news for some, or not so good news for others, is that both walls, the real one and the fictitious one, were breached. I will not delve into the discussion of human essence, first because to talk about essences goes against an evolutionary reasoning, and I am an evolutionary dude up to the module, and second because there was a whole seminar about it done here at the Institute of Advanced Studies in 2013, coordinated by Lorenzo Baravalli. The seminar is also available in video at the Institute webpage. I hope you enjoy. I will not talk about archaeology. I will now talk about archaeology and the business monkeys are doing. Monkeys, apes, and several other animals are behaving very badly these days. That's what we can say. They are not what they used to be. They are threatening several assumptions, jumping unceremoniously over the trenches. The talks we attended earlier today made this point uh, very clear. The question being posed is, could there be something like a non-human primate archaeology? Some archaeologists and almost all anthropologists would say no. The negation of the possibility is foremost that archaeology is part of the humanities, more specifically is part of anthropology, and anthropology, as the name says, is the study, study of humanity. Therefore, archaeology is constrained to study humans. Well, uh, I don't think so. 
First of all, let's define archaeology. If I say archaeology is the study of past human cultures, I'm mystifying. We do not study past human cultures because they are extinct. To say archaeologists study past human cultures would be the same as to say that paleontologists study dinosaurs. So imagine a dinosaur veterinarian. Dangerous profession, to say the least. Archaeologists study materials, more specifically artifacts or materials that were somehow modified by human action. But is the human action a necessary part of the definition? Not at all. What is necessary is the culturally transmitted behavior that can be inferred from the retrieved materials. This is an important point. So, what archaeology really is, is the study of artifacts and the relationship between them, spatial, chronological relationship, operationalized by the concept of culture. Okay, some will say, but culture is, the, is a distinctively human characteristic. Is that so? Let's define culture then. The term culture is a point of contention because it is supposedly inside the realm of anthropology. But the awful truth is that culture is so ill-defined inside anthropology that part of the professionals even say that the concept should be discarded. I will illustrate this showing two definitions of culture. The first definition that uh, Eduardo showed uh, by one of the fathers of anthropology, Edward Tyler, says that culture is that complex whole which includes knowledge, belief, art, morals, law, customs, and any other capabilities and habits acquired by human as a member of society. Is this a definition? Pause. No. It is a description of several kinds of things that we can call culture. It says that culture is a complex whole without defining it. In the 1950s, two eminent anthropologists, Alfred Kruber and Clyde Kluckholm, found no less than 164 different definitions of culture. They wrote a 219-page monography to do that, and their definition is also not very informative. Culture consists of patterns, explicit and implicit, of and for, behavior acquired and transmitted by symbols, constitute the distinct achievements of human groups, including their embodiments in artifacts. The essential core of culture consists of traditional, it means historically derived and selected, ideas and especially their attached values. Cultural systems may, on the one hand, be considered as products of action, on the other hand, as conditioning elements of further action. This definition has several problems. For instance, uh, is culture always transmitted by symbols, never by observation or imitation? It is distinct, the distinctive achievement of humans. Why? By some law? So, after more than 60 years, the situation is far from being solved. One of the more recent definitions seems very elucidative of the state of the art. Take that. Culture is a socio historic contingent wave phenomenon immanent in social practice, dimensionalized by semiotic characteristics. Did you get the message? No. Okay, so explain, because I didn't. What I can say is that there is no way archaeologists can, or want, or should use culture in the same sense as anthropologists. It's not a question of academic, academic politics, or the limitation of academic fields. It's a question of interest. Anthropology is interested in the here and now, in live people, in functioning societies. Archaeolo archaeologists, on the other hand, are mostly, not always, mostly interested in on the past or the deep expanses of time that connect extinct cultures to ourselves and dead men tell no tales. To be operationally useful, any definition of culture inside the realm of archaeology needs to get rid of stuff we cannot know in advance. If we use the concept of culture to study artifacts, 
the concept cannot be charged with assumptions such as morals, law, customs, beliefs, or wave phenomena. We use the concept of culture to arrive to conclusions, so we cannot start from the conclusions. Seems obvious, but this confusion between the port of departure and the, part, the point of arrival is pretty common in archaeology. I don't know about the other humanities. I will only say about archaeology. It's also important to note that archaeology is part of anthropology only in the United States. This is, does not hold for the rest of the world. It has to do with the influential figure of Franz Boas, a German anthropologist who is considered a founding father of, of North American uh, anthropology. In Boas' view, archaeology was part of anthropology with a capital A. So there was anthropology with a capital A as a major endeavor together with sociocultural anthropology, physical anthropology, and linguistics. So this was the, the four fields. Uh, archaeology, therefore, is not sociocultural anthropology, but a sister discipline. Boas did not put any uh, relationship of high hierarchy between them. It was just four things you should study to understand humanity, so anthropology with a capital A. What happened is that there was a conflation between one of them, that is sociocultural anthropology, and the anthropology with capital A. That's a major confusion people, people make. Um, hence, what sociocultural anthropologists have to say about culture, cultural traits, etc., is related to their interests and their business. Okay? In other parts of the world, archaeology is either in its own separate department, uh, in England this is common, or together with quaternary geology, or with arts, or within language departments. This is because archaeology is such an interdisciplinary enterprise. So, what is culture from an archaeologist's point of view? Of course, I will give you a definition I consider useful, and it's a bare-bone definition because it has to be operational. Culture is learned and shared behavior. Nothing more, nothing less. This definition is sufficient to separate the innate behavior from cultural, learned behavior, and also sufficient to separate mental and behavioral idiosyncrasies, like individual person aspects from the cultural norms shared by the whole group. We scared to note that this sharing does not necessarily stand to the whole group. You, you, you have a share of ideas that can be uh, gender related or age related, that's it, but that's okay. A lot of people share. It's not some weirdness of yourself. That's the idea. Uh, I start from the assumption that there is no way to learn and share some behavior without some brain process. You cannot learn or share some behavior is if, the, if the other doesn't have a brain process. Okay. Uh, which implies that any organism that learns, teaches, and shares behaviors does so through what we commonly call ideas. You can give another name, like, oh, I cannot say animals have ideas. Well, they give another name, but it's a brain process, and the name is idea. If the definition seems to be very concise, it is because it may break the tradition inaugurated by Tyler's original definition, followed later by the hundreds of versions compiled by Kruber and Klugholm, but a closer look shows that it leaves none of the classic aspects such as symbolism, myths, etc. Since these aspects only enter into the cultural domain and leave the idiosyncratic when they are effectively learned and shared. Arts, morals, laws, customs, knowledge, religion, myths, etc. are all absolutely contained by this definition. The power of this definition lies precisely in the fact that it does not unravel a laundry list of characteristics that culture must possess to be culture, which, as we put it, are actually descriptions, not definitions. What is the advantage of working with a rigorous and apparently dry definition? It helps in the reasoning process. 
The moment we understand what the foundation of the concept is, we are not lost in a kind of ether, in an entanglement of descriptions that make us think that culture is sometimes a thing, sometimes an idea. Prevents us to think that culture is something that is studied, but at the same time, it's a concept. The definitions of culture in the literature have this confusing feature. They seem to be very complete and inclusive to simplify several phenomenic aspects, but they do not establish exactly what we are talking about in conceptual terms. Perhaps it's never too much to remember that culture is a concept. It is in the realm of ideas. It's a concept composed by, of two other concepts, that of behavior and that of ideas. Culture is not a process, nor some essence that pervades human societies. It's neither the divine breath, nor the object of study. Therefore, we actually cannot study human cultures, because for this we have to use the concept of culture. The concept is a tool, not an object of study. Another important implication of this definition is that it is related to the fact that culture does not define us as humans. Culture is a characteristic present in several phylogenetically unrelated animal species, what would be expected since it is such an adventurous, advantageous feature from an evolutionary point of view. Initially, studies of non-human culture was mostly focused on chimpanzees, our closest relatives, so Magrill 192, probably following the reasoning that only animals phylogenetically close to humans, such as higher primates, would have cultural capacities. Not that it's higher, it's a biblical heritage that pervades science. There was initially a great deal of resistance to this idea, especially in the human sciences, where the sense of threat to its object of study or academic territory was very uh, harsh. So Halloway Jr., 69, when the first papers about chimpanzee uh, using tools and etc., certain writings based on primate studies and early hominid evolution are needlessly depriving us of our proper domain. I will argue that it's possible to give the concept of culture, he put the Commas, no? Some force again as something unique to man. So you see, kind of, you know, we are losing territory, guys. Let's fight back. No? It's now known that cultural transmission occurs in a wide variety of animal species, many unrelated to humans. We saw today a lot of infos about capuchin monkeys who got separated from our evolutionary branch 40 million years ago. Is that right? Another strong example of cultural transmission, this time not related to material culture but to, to linguistics, was initially detected in monkeys of the geno genus Corocebus, or vervet monkeys of Africa, where the monkeys' vocalizations in nature were recorded in different situations over 14 months and then transmitted by the researchers. When the recording of leopard was played, the monkeys ran to the trees. When the uh, eagle was played, they looked at the sky because they are predators. These monkeys were predated by leopards and eagles, etc. And when one of the snakes was played, they looked at the ground. It's important to note that while adult monkeys correctly vocalized leopards, eagles, and snakes, young, young monkeys gave, gave leopard alerts to various terrestrial animals, from eagle to various birds, and from snake to snake-like objects, such as branches and etc., and the accuracy of vocalizations increased with age. So they were learning uh, a language. One of the most interesting results of animal language studies is that humans seem to have a different vocal pattern than all other primates and monkeys, but similar to bats. Some species of birds, and aquatic mammals. So this is worth reading. The data are indisputably indicative of evolutionary continuity, not only among great apes and humans, but also among all primates and perhaps all, all mammals. This is talking about artifacts and stuff. However, the situation is quite different when it comes to cognition and cortical influences on vocalization. 
Here, the vocal flexibility and volitional control that is so often sourced in primates is largely absent while being striking, strikingly clear in humans. Yet, it represents a neurophenomenon that has counterparts in birds, bats, and probably marine mammals as well. This opens a debate as to whether such behaviors would be genetically determined or, or truly cultural. Data from chimpanzees in captivity support the idea of maintaining intra-group learning behaviors, characterizing different cultural traditions between groups. But there are still those who argue that such differences would be genetic or ecological. Uh, recent data using cladistic analysis of the use of tools and genetic information of wild chimpanzees points to a lack of correlation between these factors. Strengthening the cultural model or genetically closed chimpanzees exhibited different cultural behavior even living in the same habitats. What uh, means uh, they have lines of cultural transmission and not genetically uh, determine the behavior. In retrospect, it would be strange, given the 3.8 billion years of evolution of life on Earth, and given the evolutionary advantageous, advantageous characteristics of cultural transmission, that a single species, by chance ours, would eventually be the only one to develop extra genetic information transmission. It's very probable that the capacity for culture, as presented in our definition, does not have homologous characteristics. That is, it does not depend on the phylogenetic proximity or phylogenetic line between uh, humans uh, and other animals, but has developed in an independent way, as well as the linguistic abilities that we saw previously. Of course, the proximity between humans and chimpanzees points to some homology, but this need not always be the case. It is quite possible to understand the capacity for culture as an analogy, just as eyes, which appear in both vertebrates and insects, serve to capture light, and wings appear in insects, birds, and mammals, which serve to fly. At the same time, the fact that culture does not appear in all living beings is indicative of the non-teleological and non-optimizing characteristic of evolution. Not all animals have to develop cultural transmission because evolution is not like this. There are still those who argue within the last trench that what differentiates the mind of humans from the minds of animals is, in short, the symbolic capacity. Cool, so let's define symbolism. Using a classic definition, such as that of Ogden and Richards, 1923, we would have three categories to consider. The symbol, uh, the thoughts or reference, and the referent. The authors put these three categories into a triangle, but actually it's a line, because uh, you don't have a, a, a line uh, between symbol and referent. It has to uh, go through the reference or the, the thought. Thus, at the first moment, a sentient being, whom we will call the receiver, perceives a symbol, which can be anything other than the referent. It may be something written, but it may also be something spoken, or a sound, or an icon. In a second moment, the symbol will cause the receiver of the symbol to decode it through the middle thing, the toss. In a third moment, this decoding will make the receiver think about the referent. So, music, Mozart, makes you think about grammar. Uh, so, if symbolism is mentally projecting something into another thing, both of which are not directly related, there is no direct relation between them. For instance, remember someone, mental construction, when listening to a particular music that's a physical stimulus, it's obvious that there is the capacity for symbolic elaboration in other animals. Just observe Rex, the dog, that when he hears the noise of a car engine, gets extremely excited because he associates the noise to Tom, the human. Who is arriving. Rex does not see Tom, 
nor smells Tom, nor hears his voice. The only possible conclusion, unless we appeal to extra sens sensory perception or some uh, god of the gift of God, is that Rex makes a mental image of Tom at the sound of the engine. The auditory stimulus, which has absolutely no physical relation to Tom as a person, is only the displacement of sound waves produced by the controlled explosion of fuel moving the pistons of the engine. This caused Rex to think about the presence of the human. This is a symbolic association. We can speak in, about degrees of symbolism or abstraction, but not in presence, absence. The presence of symbolism, something that would define us as humans. It's interesting that when it comes to dogs, we give the name conditional behavior. But when it comes to humans, the same phenomenon is called the remembrance. This is not conditional behavior because Rex was not inside the lab. Rex made this association for his own, his own will. He learned that association. And he has to have some mental, some brain process to think about Tom. Another important implication that must be taken into account by proponents of the idea of humanity equals symbolism is the so-called symbolic revolution a sudden appearance of the symbolic capacity that would have occurred only about 120,000 years ago, visible in the archaeological record mainly by the proliferation of art and which would have spread from Africa in an extremely fast way to the rest of humanity. Although I personally do not believe in this model, the fact is that if it's true, we will have an interesting situation in which much of the work of European archaeologists would be no more related to the study of humanity, but of primates of the genus Homo, absolutely devoid of the essence of humanity. However, data from other parts of the world do not fit this scenario, especially in Asia. The idea of a symbolic revolution is obviously very closely related to the biblical idea of the divine breath. There is no good explanation why this would happen. From an evolutionary point of view, if we consider any attribute of our species as relevant, that attribute cannot have come from nothing. This is a logical impossibility from a Darwinian point of view. There can be no evolutionary study of a character, however specific and restricted to a species it is, what biologists call autopomorphisms, if there is no recognition that this character should already be present in an earlier form. If human cognition is an uh, autopomorphism, it must necessarily be present in some state in the ancestral forms. To deny this is to deny that there may be any evolutionary study of human cognition. And in that case, we would enter the, into the metaphysical religious ex explanations uh, like Henri Bergson. In sum, with regard to the question of the attribution of culture, intentionality, and agency to animals, we share with Dennett, 1983, the view that it's more productive to assume that such characteristics exist than to revolve around sterile behavioral descriptions which hinder the formulation of hypotheses and experiments. Such a statement, which was fe feasible back in 1983, is even more defensible today, given the wide range of data obtained by ethology in the last decades. The only certain thing we know about the mental capacity of other animals is that we are truly ignorant of them. That's a trap we usually put ourselves in. It's far too easy to perceive animal cognition as being part of a ladder that reaches our cognitive superpowers. However, try to imagine what is to see the world through sound, like bats do. Or recognize your family by infrasonic waves inside the water, as whales do. Or have the sense of smell of a dog, seeing the dark like a cat. Look, looking at our sis, sister species, chimpanzees, are they sort of cognitively lacking something? Of course, it makes no sense from an evolutionary point of view. 
which cognition is more evolved? We know the question is silly. However, we still tend to see other animals as lacking something. If we have time, I will show you in the end uh, a sh short video about this. So, if archaeology is the study of artifacts by means of the concept of culture, and if artifacts are made or used by other creatures, archaeology is absolutely okay to deal with that. Archaeology already saw its horizons expanding regarding chronology, for instance, being devoted to study of garbage left by modern societies, or the study of artifacts used and made by contemporary communities. The interests of the discipline run across gender studies, feminist studies, queer studies, and so on. To expand to other animals is a very small step, or not. Now we make full circle and we go back to philosophy. When I talked about Montaigne, I did not mention the fact that in one of his famous essays, Apology for, of Raymond Sebon, the same essay he mentions his cat, Montaigne talk about similarities and dissimilarities about humans and other animals. In one passage he wrote, this is by the same vanity of imagination that he equals himself to God, attributes to himself divine qualities, withdraws and separates himself from the crowd of other creatures, cuts out the shares of the animals, his fellows and companions. It seems a critique to Descartes, but Descartes was later than him. Uh, how does he know, by the strength of his understanding, the secret and internal motions of animals? For Montaigne, animals were fellows and companions. In another essay, Montaigne says that animals have the same capacity for excellence as humans. The difference between some humans and some animals being smaller than the difference between humans themselves. Of course, this is a very uh, uh, dangerous assumption. Descartes does not, arguing that there was an insurmountable gap. Spinoza, on the other hand, was not so sure. For Spinoza, there are only differences of degree between humans, animals, machines, and rocks against some centuries before Bruno Latour. According to Sharp, 2011, for Spinoza, there is no ontological chasm between what has a mind and what does not. The foundations of reason exist as much in rocks, salamanders, and computers as they do in those beings we call human. Moreover, Spinoza notes the differences in nature between a human and a horse, but also between a drunk and a philosopher. What to say about a drunk philosopher? I don't know. So, in this particular aspect, Spinoza was closer to Montaigne than to Descartes. At the same time, and as we saw, exactly because of this perceived dangerous proximity Spinoza was, was a severe critic of any compassion towards animals. Descartes gave his solution. There is an insurmountable gap. Okay. Spinoza was like, but they are so close. No? Uh, he despairs at the satirists who disdain men and admire the brutes, rather than helping their fellow men and joining forces against the dangers which threaten on all sides. So here we see how Spinoza's fears are so modern, or how our modern fears are so old. If we concede culture to other animals, there is the danger of animalizing ourselves. In what kinds of monstrosities humanity can incur if we lose this divine touch, this cultural vanish? The answer to me is that we lose nothing. From Spinoza's time to now, we built atomic weapons, killed millions of people under the more diverse ideological banners, and continue to think we are special. I see no reason why the acknowledgement that we are just another species would make us worse, on the contrary. Do we have time for a brief? Okay, so about cognition, this is a good question. Which cognition is more evolved? Oh, primates are just, you know, they are proxy of our ancestors. Well, they, they are contemporaneous, they are contemporaneous to us, so. 
Um, let's see what happens here. This is a video that, if it works, I'm not sure, shows uh, uh, ah. So this is the same uh, Kyoto, the University of Kyoto sanctuary that it was shown here. And, and this guy here, uh, he sees numbers. And as soon as he touched the first number, all other numbers disappear under these uh, squares. So he has split second to memorize the number. Mizizi, you know, nine numbers. Got it. Sometimes uh, he mis he's mistaken, but try to do. Go, go ahead. Got it. Oh, it's very easy, you know. A chimp can do it. Let's go, people. Memorize it. Ah, now we have a human. Oh, she's playing with five numbers, okay? Not nine, but it's, it's okay. Oh, fail. Right, let, let's help her. Fail. Go ahead. Only five, five numbers. The chimp gets fail. So what this means? Means that the cognition is different means that you cannot compare a four-wheel drive and a sports car. One is not no better than the other. They are suited for different purposes. Perhaps chimps have this photographic... Oh, and there is a, a nice part here because, I don't know if, if, if he went... He got... Um, he, see, he sees... And, and his attention is to our other side. And you say, ah, he will fail. No! Did you, did you get this? Uh, he, he, he sees the screen and then his attention got... And then he said, ah, he will fail. And then beep, boop, 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 boop. So, they have a photographic memory. They just look at something and, and take, it, take the picture. So, they probably know where the leopard is or something like this. I don't know, but it's a different cognition. It's not... Well, it's better in this sense, but, but you know? It's different cognition. So, um, thank you. And the answer is, of course, archaeology has all everything to do with primatology and should be expanded and we should work together. That's it. Um, I have a, I, I, want, I want to put in per, into perspective, Vito, my name is Vito. Uh, I want to put into perspective the learned aspect of the uh, uh, call systems of primates. So you've mentioned that they have some sort of experiencing, experience playing a role in that. Uh, and that it would be, you know, it would count as learning. But um, there is evidence uh, related not only to the aspect of the amount of things that they can perceive in order to produce a vocalization, but also the uh, vocal structure of the vocalization is it seems to be innate to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so for instance, the, the, the acoustic features of, of non-human primate infants uh, seem uh, quite alike those of the adult, uh, adult uh, animals of the same species in case of the vervets. And also, if you take into account uh, the amount of, so for instance, uh, uh, say Farth and Chini have, uh, have shown that uh, when um, a vervet monkeys are giving vocal calls to you, uh, alarm calls to uh, eagle, the eagle alarm call, it, uh, it's not for a random species. They have to bear a feature in which it's something that's in the air. So for instance, even a falling leaf can, uh, you know, uh, produce, can give this, uh, this individual to produce, uh, uh, an infant individual to produce an alarm call. So it's not random. So it seems that, okay, it's reasonable to say that, uh, that they, can, they have some sort of classes in the world that they, are, they seem to be predisposed to perceive and categorize. Of course, they have, there is a role of learned, but this learning is quite little in the sense that 
it's reasonable that they would not be fully 100% genetically predetermined to perceive eagles, but they have to be predisposed to perceive things in the air, for instance, or things on the ground, or, or terrestrial mammals. And uh, they, are, they are involved in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an environment that you're gonna find 150 spe different species, mm -hmm. and they can change. So it's reasonable that they don't have it fully specified. So oh, the yeah. role of learning is, is, is quite little. They, they, they basically determine that at some point at five years of age. Yeah, yeah. I, I imagine if that uh, if the, uh, the species of the felon or the eagle change, mm -hmm. perhaps they will use the same yes. call. Yes. But uh, I think this is not a problem. I think that uh, the, the interesting thing about the paper is that uh, juveniles tend to mistake, tend to make, make mistakes, while adults tend to make uh, the correct assignment when it's really an ego and or not a. Anyway, uh, I think it's uh, the idea is, is not to, to say that uh, uh, look, uh, uh, they they are almost reaching us or something like. It's a totally different cognition. I, I only mean that. Uh, the vocalization itself is probably learned dash shared. Uh, the 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 sound, you know, uh, something like this could be a different sound. Could not be that sound because uh, at least there are three different sounds. I imagine I didn't. I never heard the the vocalizations themselves. I only read heard the paper. But uh, at least three different sounds for three different stuff. You know? so. Uh, and it, it seems that they have to learn to assign correctly. So I think it's, it's a nice example of some kind of cultural transmission. Uh, yeah, because that, in this case, you do, it doesn't seem that they have uh, actual pedagogy from the, 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 the mother or the father to say, well, you have to give this vocalization this particular We never content. know. Yeah. Like, we, don't have, we don't know how to test this. It can be only imitation uh, from others, can be... Yeah, uh, they they live in communities, no? so they can imitate the older, uh, not necessarily the mother and the father. So um, cultural transmission doesn't have to be. Uh, it's it's never uh, the vertical. It's always cross uh, transversal. So the important thing is that uh, any juvenile in any species like is pretty dumb. No? And so they have to learn stuff, and they will learn stuff from, from the other, other, other people. I think that's kind of uh, natural or widespread. It's not natural. It's widespread in several species. That's, that's the idea, not, not, not that they... Uh... Anyway, uh, we can talk about the whales. You know, uh, it's another amazing example. They, they live in the, the pots, they say pots, uh, Groups of whales that have a totally different behaviors, hunting behaviors, a vocalization is different. Uh, they tend to intermarry, intramarry, not intermarry. They, they tend to to marry, to marry, to uh, <laughs> to have <laughs> mate. They have to mate. They they mate between the pod, inside the pod. So they are pretty much like tribes. You know? but they are orcas, killer whales. So the more we know about this stuff going on, uh, and also they, they have a lot of characteristics. They, have, they are very long-lived. They have a lot of time to learn stuff. You know? But the, the orcas that go out of the water and, and take the seals on the beach, only the orcas from Patagonia do, do that. They develop that strat strategy, and no other orca in the world does that. So it, it's a thing that it's culturally transmitted. Why I say culturally? Because by the definition, it's shared behavior that's not genetically uh, transmitted. So I, I see no problem with the cultural extension as, as the artifact extension. I didn't, I didn't uh, talk about the artifacts, but everybody in the audience perceived that we use artifact in a very uh, inclusive uh, definition of artifact. That is the best. Like, Way before I imagined I would be here one day talking about primate archaeology, 
I use the inclusive definition of artifact because uh, for archaeology it's very important. Otherwise, we, you just throw away stuff. If you don't use the very inclusive, like artifact is anything that's modified by human action, including its location. That's the definition of artifact I use. Now I have to change that. Anything that was modified by culturally uh, related behavior, including its uh, location. So that's the, the idea. It's my turn. Uh, my name is Maria, and uh, first, thank you for the presentation. I really appreciate your philosophical standpoints. And my question is quite related to his question. Uh, uh, your definition of culture, it was like shared behavior, shared or? Yeah. Shared, learned Sorry. and shared. I don't remember. But yeah, it's like shared behavior. And learned, it has to be learned. Learned or shared. Yeah. And the, this process of learning and sharing behavior, it, it implies some transmission of Yes, what, what we call cultural transmission. <laughs> so, yeah, the concept of cultural transmission is central. Yes, yeah, the, central. It, it implies some transmission. So, I have two questions. The first is, uh, is it okay to suppose, according to this definition, that uh, due to the lack of a sophisticated language, uh, primates or other animals would uh, have more cultural discontinuities than humans because, um, you know, they can't transmit it so in such a sophisticated way as we do in schools. Mm -hmm. and, and if uh, we can't um, consider this language, this tool to transmit culture, Transmit culture as like a, a like a human privilege uh, over other species in having a more um, um, having a continuous continuity in, in, in the chain in, in the transmission yes, chain. Yeah, in the transmission and uh -huh. this continuity, in my opinion, it uh, it involves some improvement because we can have. Uh, Access to the ideas of the past, and we can we can read about it, yeah, and no, we can definitely. I, I agree. I think I think that uh, once once you 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 have a language, uh, it's uh, it makes a lot of difference for sure. Because, but at the same time, at the same time, uh, um, uh, we uh, we have a bias towards like uh, academic. Academics, like like we we read a lot of stuff, we learn a lot of stuff, reading and etc. But not all human societies uh, use uh, written stuff. Of course, they will use the, the only the language and 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 this. Uh, I think this is the major difference, not the written thing. The written make, make makes a lot of difference for the last centuries, but most part of human culture had had to be. Uh, passed by oral tradition or oral transmission. And of course, this makes a lot of, of difference. Uh, however, there are several, several, several arts and crafts or ways of doing stuff that are transmitted by imitation. So, and so it's not only language uh, that solves everything. Uh, I cannot explain to you how to flint nap. I, I, we can spend a whole week talking about what you have to do to f make a, a hand axe. And you will never learn. You have to see, you, know, you have to imitate, and I, I have to show you by gesture, and not only talking about. So, uh, so of course, uh, it makes a huge difference, but the most part of the time, uh, I, I think imitation, uh, more than words was a key point because we, we have a hand axes being produced from from, from 1.7 until uh, well for 600,000 years you know 
something like this. Uh, six, uh, 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 600,000 years, more or less. Uh, and these guys, it, they probably didn't speak as we speak because of the, well, there are inferences that they didn't speak as we, as we like the Homo erectus. Uh, but they were able to make like very nice hand axes, so uh, the, the chain of cultural transmission was so strong these guys kept making hand axes for a, such a long time, and hand axes were so useful. And so, so you can have a very strong lines of transmission, even without uh, oral uh, or, or written uh, information. But of course, uh, uh, it helps a lot. Of course, I think. I think the the the, uh, the example of the 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 symbolic symbolic dash language s symbolic because it, it was it, it was like when the when the chimpanzee i mentioned in the 1991 paper when he made vocalizations and beat it on the tree trunk he was able to direct the movement so and this this behavior got lost because of the of a uh, of, uh, number of chimpanzees uh, that were able to decodify, and and this older male, uh, even when the population uh, regrows, uh, he gave up. Uh, this this behavior was ne never seen again. So I think it's a hell of a good example of how things can be. Uh, can be lost. And in archaeology, we have several examples of losing uh, technologies. Several, several. Tasmania is a good example. People forgot a lot of stuff, a lot of useful stuff. They forgot how to make boats. They forgot how to make needles. They forgot how to make uh, clothing for the winter. They forgot to make a lot of stuff. So, but of course, when you write, it's <laughs> easier to, to get it again. Good afternoon. My name is Josiane, and, and I'd, like, I'd, uh, I'd like to ask you two questions. Uh, the first one, you said that the term culture can be extended to other animals. So can the studies in archaeology also be extended to other than monos and chimpanzees? Yeah, I, I like if you have the, the I think definitely yes. Uh, if if you have material byproducts of the behavior, yes, because archaeology is all about the materials. We are interested in the materials left by s some cultural behavior. Uh, so if if the animal, any animal, does some stuff that leaves uh, material traces. I'm okay with it. I think archaeology could be expanded. Like, the problem is that a lot of behaviors doesn't leave <coughs> material, you know? Like the, the uh, crows, for instance, they use a lot of tools and stuff, but they don't leave uh, an archaeological record. Like, so it's hard to make a crow archaeology, but I would like to. Yes, and uh, the second one is related. Um, are the universities prepared to this kind of researches that mix all the other stuffs other than archaeology? Well, <laughs> yeah, I, I think uh, I think the, the answer is yes, uh, and uh, we have all these colleagues here working together, being funded. <laughs> like uh, that's important, being funded to do this, uh, but. Um, I, I imagine there would be some concern, some, I, I heard about, like, that's why I, I put in my talk the, the, the end part of Spinoza's idea. They, they, they seem like, when, when Spinoza and, and, well, when Spinoza says that there are degrees of reason, but including rocks and stuff, you know, uh, I personally don't, don't agree that rocks have a degree of reason, but uh, the idea, the, the metaphysics or the ontology of the thing is of continuity, you know? 
um, and and this uh, this uh, this make this makes people uh, afraid. So it's possible that in some parts, in some departments, on some universities, people would be not willing to, to do this kind of transposition. Uh, no, archaeology has to do with people for ethical reasons, in a way. And I don't see ethical reasons. I don't see ethical reasons for pretending something. If you pretend something, you are not being ethical. So that, that's my personal point of view. And I don't, I don't see a danger for humanity if you treat animals as you no know, part of a continuum. I don't see a problem, but some people eventually can see. So that, uh, the answer is, uh, I think uh, it's, um, uh, it's totally feasible, and, but at the same time, I think it will uh, take a, a, long, of, a long time uh, to incorporate this uh, in Brazil, inside the, the archaeological community. So, uh, these things tend to take a, uh, some time to, to reach here. We are still in, in gender studies. That's something that's kind of, you know. So uh, I think uh, our post-processualism or things like this that are a bit of bit old, you know, uh, post-modernism thinking. We are still in post-modern in archaeology in Brazil. You know? we, and this is a goal, you know? So I think it, 20 years from now, you have a <laughs> everybody. It's okay. Primate archaeology is okay. So when you were showing the uh, your definition of culture, and then you 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 also highlighted that it's observed in many unrelated uh, taxa, right? And then you said, well, of course, because it's so adventurous. Uh, it, you, you say that. Yeah, yeah. It's recorded, no, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's adventurous. So that reminds me uh, when I teach the human evolution course, and then one of the last lectures is about culture and, well, mostly stone tools, but culture in general. So uh, we review all the other uh, animals that have to use and things like that. And then I always ask my students the opposite question, like if culture or to use is so great, why is it so rare? Yeah, yeah. and I think the question is that because evolution is not, the answer is that because evolution is not optimizing. I think that's a, a very nice case to say people, not only it's branching, never unilinear, but it's also not optimizing. So that's not, that's why not all animals in the world have a strong cultural behavior. Some have, some not. So, so uh, I think that's the, the, the answer. Yeah. A lot of comments accumulating. Just before I forget, Vito, uh, Astolfo mentioned cetaceans, which for vocal communication purposes are much better than primates. And in cetaceans, you can see rapid uh, feds changing in vocal communication. For instance, uh, uh, a male dolphin comes to the region of another group and making some mating calls, and these new mating calls are more attractive to local females. So they tend to mate with this guy. The next season, all the males in that group change the vocalization to, the, to this new vocalization, and they can do this. Birds, some birds learn once uh, while watching the, 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 the other birds and never change. Some listen, but they just practice the next year based on something stored in their memories. And other species change every year as, uh, as the, 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 the repertoire of the populations go changing. So depending on the species, What I wanted to put into perspective is that the window of learning in the system is very, you know, uh, narrow. Uh, 
No, so in the case in the case in the case of, of, of alarm calling systems, so if you're talking about birds, they have vocal learning. And if you're talking about amphibians, they have vocal learning. So in this sort of innovation in which you can insert behavior as some kind of an acting factor in this system, okay, but in, in the case of, 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 of non-human primate alarm calling systems, what we seem to have is that it's not that the, all the system is 100% genetically determined, but the, the, the yeah. window that you have for learning is very narrow. Just, it's just because I agree that the the, the 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 definition seems quite you know more satisf satisfactory in in, in in all general terms, but uh, in the case of, of of this kind of vocal systems, yeah. we do have this very short narrow of le uh, learning factor yeah. at play. The the only thing we have to be aware is uh, 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 when when you say narrow, uh, I understand what what you say, but most people tend to put it's narrow, but uh, uh, narrow as uh, some kind of uh, disability or something like this, that I'm sure is not what you're talking about. But uh, it's important just to, for the general audience, <laughs> uh, just to say that it's adequate, is what they need. They don't need a hundred word, hundred calls, no? They need three. That's why it's narrow. I think that's the idea. But uh, then uh, you mentioned Kruber, and then later you mentioned Bill McGrew, uh, and well, I was very fond of chimps when I studied. I, I have no, I had no idea that I would be involved with capuchin monkeys. We never have children, <laughs> but I was very fond of learning about chimps because of evolutionary continuity, things like that. I had a hard time because people in the application school here got very offended because I was, I was going to compare number cognition in their children to the chimpanzees. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, unfortunately, I didn't have the chimps, but I just mentioned them. But uh, uh, reading a Bill McGrew's book, uh, Chimpanzee Material Culture, was uh, like, uh, it changed my life because it was like one or two years before I by chance learned about capuchins cracking nuts. So, but uh, then uh, one of the, his early papers, uh, Bill McGrew is one of the guys who started to use the term cultural primatology because it, we are now, now it's not a, 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 a threatening term. There's a common subfield that we mentioned that's cultural primatology. He was one of the pioneers. And one of the first things he did was to take a list by Kruber of criteria to show that a behavior is cultural and showed one by one, you could perhaps uh, not one behavior could be a great example of all those criteria by Kruber, but he had an example for each of the criteria in the, uh, in the behavior of chimpanzees. Yeah, yeah. And the, the thing is that when, when uh, uh, the thing is, is that uh, if, you, if you define uh, things uh, with sharp and short definitions, I think they are the best because then people, uh, well, they can still argue about the definition, but it, it, it becomes clearer. The, the thing about the Kreber and uh, several of the anthropologists' definitions is that they are not clear and they put a lot of laws, morals, and etc. And of course, we will not say about laws and morals uh, of the chimpanzees. Then, then, uh, then this makes, but uh, I, I what I'm saying is that I see how people could uh, disagree with McGrew in saying that uh, his definition was perhaps like this one or something like this. Very, this one, oh, it's not appearing, but that culture is, is learn and shared behavior. Uh, but uh, for sure, uh, uh, he, I, I, I know he, he had a lot of trouble uh, with this idea of uh, chimpanzee culture. And now it's much easier to. to to say, tell, uh, say about this, but uh, I, I saw several uh, critics kind of saying, "Oh, you know, you guys, uh, uh, you are primatologists, and culture is our domain. We know what culture is." And and, and this this definition of culture you're using, oh, this is an old one. This is a, a common rhetoric. Oh. This definition, oh, it's too dry, and, and uh, we, we, we came over it. Now we are in another level of discussion. I, I heard this several times. Uh, 
kind of re rhetoric to, to say, no, you don't know what you are talking. Culture is much richer than this definition or something like this. And it's just not true. Like, actually, there is no good definition from the anthropological point of view. They don't define. That's the point. As symbolism. Because I, I, I had to go after a definition of symbolism because everything, everybody says about symbolism, symbolism all, all the time, but there is not a single definition of symbolism. So if you go after a definition and make it clear what you are talking about, then I think it's, everything uh, becomes more, becomes clearer. And I, I think for sure, uh, McGrew's work is seminal in this, it's very important. But you know that there was a lot of criticism even today. You know, and I, I just think that the criticism is misplaced and, and instead of, uh, of producing uh, uh, dialogue, uh, it tends to produce uh, more separation. No, uh, as saying, no, no, uh, the definition of culture is way ahead. We are in another level of discussion, and it's not true. It's not true. It's even being uh, discarded, actually, because they see no use. They don't, don't have a good use for it. Uh, any other questions? I'll make a comment, but I can wait. Uh, you can do it. No, I think it's okay. okay. Thank you for your talk. I really enjoyed this end of discussion. Um, I have one question, but first I would like to make a comment. Uh, I really enjoy your, when you say that the main difference between humans and chimps in the example you gave is that they are different, just that. The cognition is different. Yeah, yeah, you say about cognition, but considering the definition of culture you work with, I think it is more appropriate to talk about interaction they have their kind of interaction that make them learn what they learn within them and when they interact with other humans, with other animals. And for example, in this discussion that Victor brought um, about the monkeys and if they are learning or not, one thing we can say for sure, they interact. And this interaction has some impact on how they behave. And uh, talking about interaction, um, when you talk about, we talk about human interaction, human language is something that is a very characteristic of our kind of interaction. And when we try to attribute or question the attribution of things like culture to animals, and I think this discussion is taken to attributing emotions to animals and mental capacity to animals, these discussions, I think, should be, we should pay attention to the fact that these are words of our language. Culture, love, um, thought, these are words of human language. And they were crafted to deal with human interaction, human behavior. So I think this is something that should be considered when talking about this, not only if ontologically they have that capacity, but how do we use these concepts yes. to attribute them? And I think this was brought many times today here. For example, in the beginning when someone asked um, the first person, I, I don't remember the name, the first talk, asked uh, what was your criteria to say that the, the uh, child, oh yes, sorry, that the monkeys had or not had attention. And he said, well, we don't need to say if it has or not. We don't work with it. We just observe and see what they are doing. So now we, I come to my question. When you defined culture as a learned and shared, a shared, and shared behavior. behavior, you made a jump from behavior to mental process. And I didn't understand that jump, since it okay. seems to me that you, you have, can... You have to remember that half the field of psychology reject all discussion about mental states. We don't know about mental state. We have words. Yeah, we that, don't... That's, why I'm, uh, that's what I'm saying. It seems to me that 
all our discussions were okay when we were in the domain of behavior. And so you that's, made that that's jump what, to that's mental... That's all we can know about any other organism, even if it's our own species I to, I totally behavior. agree. I totally agree. Yeah. And then you say that other animals have Language culture. Language is behavior. Yes, totally. I'm on you. I'm with yeah. you. When you say other animals have culture or that they love those things, we are talking about behavior. We are not observing any mental process. Yeah. So I would like to understand why that jump. Okay. It's yeah, inside, yeah, I think it's, it's not unnecessary. A jump. Yeah, I don't think it's a jump. I think it's a logical entanglement. Because uh, if some sentient being sees something and imitates, it has to be something going into his brain. That's it. Uh, a diffuse, uh, uh, you see, they don't have a brain because... Uh, don't have, uh, it's not a chordate, is it? Like a tree or a, a, a bacteria or something like this, is this? Yeah, but because it seems to me that it puts another wall that is no, brain. No, no, uh, has, no, uh, we, wow, this is a very metaphysical thing. <laughs> did you, like did, you read, did you read The Secret Life of Trees? No. no, it's a book that the guy puts that trees, they, they basically take, take decisions. We don't know, he doesn't know how. Perhaps they have a, not for, for sure they don't have a brain, but they have something going on. Uh, so I will not delve into this, I have no idea, but um, I can change from brain to uh, for the something that uh, gives uh, the power of decision or something like this. What, oh, sorry? A nervous system. A nervous system, yeah, something like this. So something has, uh, I don't think uh, the like bacteria imitate bacteria. So uh, it's, not a, uh, it's not a wall. It's probably the 50 shades of gray that I put in the title. I, I'm not putting any wall. But uh, up to some point you don't see and at some point you start to see. That's the idea. So. Going to the part we start to see, uh, and we, we are talking about culture uh, among animals that by chance have brains. Perhaps it's not by chance, but they, they do have brains. Um, for, for, uh, for any uh, imitation, the sentient being that is imitating has to have something going on inside it. But to, in order to imitate, that, that's the point. So it's not a jump, it's a logical conclusion because uh, it's not a reflex. Mm -hmm. It's not that you kick it and then you know, reflex. Something is happening and that sentient being that is aware of that something does the same. So it has to have some uh, mental thing going on, some process some, uh, that we can call thought or idea, the idea of imitating. You have to have an idea that, look, I will imitate. Uh, so I, th I think it's not a jump, it's a, a logical conclusion. And um, uh, talking about the words, that's why um, uh, it's very, very, very important to define the terms. So when I say culture is shared and learned behavior, uh, I have a, a, a point uh, of departure, and from them, I can start building a reasoning. If I say culture, ah, everybody knows what culture is, okay? So let's go. Then, the, it, then it's it's dangerous. And unfortunately, the tendency to define things is a bit uh, of the fas of fashion, of fashion. Uh, you, you read some, uh, like, w when I, I was younger, like, uh, I read a paper of, uh, talking about, like, geoarchaeology. Geoarchaeology is, well, my, my speciality is a thing that is a bit of uh, archaeology and earth sciences and stuff like this. And I read a paper, the guy saying, you know, geoarchaeology is an ambiguous concept. And it's very good that it's ambiguous, because it's nice to be ambiguous. I was like, no. No, I don't think it's nice, so I'm kind of Cartesian, but now you know that the cat era, it was friend of animals, so no problem. Uh, so, I, uh, it, once 
once you define culture or define symbolism, then we can start, start to talk. But if I don't define symbolism and say, no, symbolism is that thing that only humans have, well, so we, 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 we don't go away. And so, if you define love, and if, if it's a definition, it's an operational definition, and I will not try to define law here today, okay? <laughs> but you can eventually, given your definition, say that, okay, love implies, like, uh, uh, is, uh, is an animal that defends the, uh, it's, uh, the, 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 the younglings, uh, is it love? Well, by my definition, it is. So you can put, put love in that relationship. But if you don't define, everything is lost. So we, um, you, you talk it about uh, instead of culture, uh, uh, relationship? Instead no. of cognition, instead interaction. Of interaction. Um, I think interaction, so instead of cognition, no instead of culture. Instead of cognition, OK, OK. Uh, interaction, I, I think, is such a broad term that like, if you define it, OK, but to me, it seems too broad to be useful because you have interaction between atoms. Yeah, exactly. right? So for our purposes, perhaps the, the word interaction is not as useful as cognition because I can interact with, with a stone that <laughs> fell into my head. You know? It's an interaction. So cognition, I think, is, is more, uh, uh, goes better to the point because means that you see something, you recognize, probably the cognition, cognite, or some Latin thing, perhaps my bell knows. <laughs> you recognize, and, and uh, at least you recognize. Doesn't mean that you will take an, an action or we will interact. I can just recognize that, no, there is a, a drawer in the, in the end, or there is a weird person over there. No, there is nobody over there. They can recognize and do nothing, so there is no interaction. So I think cognition is different from interaction, but no problem. We can use the term we, we want. The important thing is always, always define the term, I think. That's the most important thing. Once you define, you can call it Mickey Mouse, no problem. And, and then we can go ahead. I think that's the point. That's my point. No, no, that's that, their point. question because uh, I have some comments but I think they are better as closing remarks so thank you very much for your talk my name is Carlos uh, it's a question related to her questions uh, to her question uh, do you think that it is possible to, de to decide from, from the data uh, something like that intentionality is necessary to explain animal behavior? Because I don't, I don't see that the data rule out alternative hypotheses like adaptive behavior or ecological affordances. And for example, when you say that an animal imitates a behavior. Someone could say something like uh, a learning machine also yeah, can like a, reproduce cars. an intelligent behavior yeah. or an, a dynamical system can reproduce an intelligent be behavior. So maybe the data point us to other direction, to the direction that tools, intelligence and cognition is not a, a, an exquisite a property of humans. It is only adaptive behavior and affordances ecological affordances and dynamic, dynamic uh, adaptation, but it is not more than that. Uh, okay, um, uh, I, think, I think that the, uh, yeah, yeah. the discussion about animals having or, or not intentions, it's, it's a very interesting one. I think like from observation, from empirical observation, I would say they have uh, not only intentions as agency, there are very interesting papers about animal agency. Uh, of, I think 
to me, it seems very obvious that animals have agency because they choose stuff, they choose what to do. Even cat, well, cats are the agency ones, no? Uh, even dogs, like any wild animals, they are, they are, they have a strong agency. They are making decisions all the time; otherwise, they die. So, I think agency is a widespread thing. It's so widespread uh, that is not explanatory. Agency is not an explanatory concept to me, uh, because all all the creation has agency. Perhaps, well, perhaps the trees have a little bit less agency, but no, animals in a general term, again, in a very wide gray, uh, 50 shades of gray, no? you have agency everywhere. So intentions or agency, I think they are uh, very easily perceived. Uh, but to be, to, to be sure, 100% sure, I think uh, perhaps one day, uh, the the same uh, the same thing uh, Montaigne said said about how how do we know what what goes inside an animal? In his words, we will never know. Perhaps one day uh, we like they are already making uh, imaging of uh, brain. Uh, yes, but more than this, like they can predict what what the person thought. No? No, no, uh, like it's, it's very mechanical thing. Like they, they, they see the pattern of the brain oh, yeah. and they can translate the pattern into numbers, for instance. Like you see number one, they make the scan of your brain. You see number two, ta -da -da. and then uh, the, the algorithm can, can, can put in, in, in the screen what you thought. So perhaps it would be possible to make experiments and start to, to see what is going inside the mind of some animal, perhaps one day, but presently uh, not. So only for uh, uh, from, uh, empirical evidence, I would say that uh, I see at least no problem at all to put intentions and uh, desires and uh, and uh, agency uh, into animal. I don't know. I don't see any problem. So uh, I don't. I don't think it, we go to the machine side. I think we go to the biological side. That actually, almost all animals or moving animals, something like this, they they have some kind of agency. Okay. Well, uh, thank you, Astolfo. Oh, thank you. I'm, I was sort of commenting on some questions of this ladies here, but also uh, can serve as closing remarks since we expanded into the question of culture. Uh, the, the, defini the classical definitions, like Tyler's, are obviously no, no definitions, they are just descriptions of things that just humans do or something like that. But, so they are clearly useless and they are clearly uh, a sort of creationist thinking without God. Because if something happened and humans were created on a different day, and so they are essentially different. And, but part of the, the, this kind of poor definition surviving until recently is also a fault of uh, uh, evolutionary biologists. Because, uh, uh, and the uh, neo Darwinian synthesis, evolution focused on molecular evolution and nothing about culture. The, 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 the best culture could be, if you go to, to the words of Fisher Dawkins, even if he was the guy who invented the, he coined the, the term meme, which now only survives in Facebook, but anyway. Uh, but uh, the, the, the maximum role he could think about uh, the culture in the evolutionary process was a proximal one. It's an extended phenotype. It's part of the things you show to the world that will decide if you survive to leave descendants or not. Culture can be uh, useful as being strong or something like that, but that's just a proximal from one generation to the next. Uh, once we drop this old definition and start to make more evolutionary acceptable questions about culture, one of the things that emerges as, is that even if culture doesn't have the, exactly the same rules of 
molecular evolution, it has a lot of parallels. You can describe, you cannot describe uh, culture in neo-Darwinian terms because the neo-Darwinian definition of evolution is very restricted. But if you go to Darwin, Dar uh, for Darwin, evolution was variation that can be inherited and, the, and the, the difference between individuals in a population uh, generate uh, a differential fitness. Some, some characteristics lead you to the, the leave more copies, some more copies of, the, of that information. Darwin didn't know anything about genes, but so you can describe culture in Darwinian terms, uh, even if not in, uh, and then you can start thinking about how these two information systems can interact and talk about the coevolution, a gene culture coevolution. Uh, and uh, a sign of that the, the things are, are changing is that the last 20 years we saw a growing number of conferences on this evolutionary perspectives on cultural process. And a couple of years ago uh, uh, we arrived to, to the point of creating a new society, the Cultural Evolution Society, it has just underwent its second conference uh, last year. Uh, next year we have the, the third one. And the point of the, of the society is exactly to, to, to try to join forces, to try to break, the, to help to break this wall between uh, natural sciences and humanities. Uh, not uh, by overthrowing the, the, what we think is obsolete in the humanities, but join joining the useful tools developed on both sides to rethink this complex process of cultural and biological evolution uh, changing each other uh, in parallel. Uh, so, uh, uh, one great, uh, uh, primate archaeology is one of those great examples that we can join forces and, 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 and use techniques from one discipline to the other. If you don't, if you don't have any preconceptions about these animals are not cultural, so you cannot do archaeology of them. So this is a, a first example, but we do expect to see uh, uh, great improvements in this new approach to culture as, a, uh, as an important part of the evolutionary process. So uh, I, if our government doesn't destroy our funding agencies before the end of the year, I do expect to have a, 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 another workshop on cultural evolution right here uh, by the end of the year. So thank you for coming. Thank you for your interest.